Today, today's day is the 11th of August 2020 and I'm talking to Kevin Dempsey. I want to pick a reins of Longford Town. Right, well I'm bred born and reared in Longford Town. Yeah. My father before me and my grandfather before him. And I think originally the Dempseys came from Water Street. But we lived here in St Bridget's Terrace since we were here from day one. I'm not sure, we call it sometime around 1910 roughly. And we're still here, and not alone are we still here in this terrace, there's other families in this terrace that were here from day one. Well, now the people, of course, aren't, but what yeah, I mean is... The same name, or...? The same name, like, I mean, the Dowds would be here, and the McNallys would be here, mm. the Devlins would be still here, and there was, fa I miss, there was Fars, who was married to... Mick Camel, well they still own two houses, all of them don't live here but they own two houses so that would be five or six and maybe more of the original people as far as I know that's mm -hmm. here from day one. Fars is a good Longford name, eh? Yeah, well, back, the, yeah it would the be the word of Fars. Mrs Camel was Fars. Yeah, yeah. And she had her brother Mick lived up there in number three and I'd imagine that's where she came from and the Camels then, there were foul merchants in the square, we talk about that here. Yeah. They lived in number seven. But they still own the two houses, like. So what was your father's name and your grandfather's name? You my father's name was Jimmy Dempsey. And my mother's name was, well, she was Josie Dempsey, but she was Josie Gorman from Water Street. And what were their trades? Well, my father and his father before him, which would be my grandfather, were cobblers. Yeah. I think, like, my father, I think, was one of the last men in Alfred. He could make a pair of shoes, like, as far as I know. And... Uh, they were both cobblers, and on my mother's side, my mother's father was Jim Gorman. He came to work in Cameron's shop. Like Cameron's at that time, they had a shop in Longford, but they had several shops from out the, throughout the country, particularly in the north, and he came from Five Mile Town. He came as a tailor to work in Cameron's. That was my mother's father. Yeah. Okay, we, do you mind if we go street by street, like, uh, just talking about the town itself, if we start with uh, Main uh, Street? Yeah, well, I can remember, like, as I say, like, I would have been on the street, or remember the street, I suppose, like, from the early 60s, like, mm. you know, and uh, I have a fair idea, like, 95% of the businesses in Lamford or the shops in the Main Street would have been opened, like, they were all actually opened. Mm -hmm. Some of them would be open and maybe do very little, a couple of pubs that we'll mention later on. But, like, Longford would have been a very, very busy town, like, in yeah. the 60s and further up the 70s and whatever. But mm -hmm. I, I can remember, I suppose, the year of 62, we'd say, for example. Like, we'd, we'd start off, if you want, at yeah. Main Street. Like, John Gerardi's, it's now closed, like. John Gerardi's was number one Main Street, it was a pub. John Gerardi bought it as a young man and I think in the 60s he done it up and it would have been a very, very busy pub. Davy Duke and Kevin Duke, two brothers from Clundra, worked in it. That was John, just it was, uh, it would have been the GA pub like in the town at the time or one after. John Gerardi was a famous Gaelic footballer with Lanford and Leinster himself, I think. Come from Newtown Farmers from Bonnie Kenny. Number two, you had McGuinnesses. Hmm. The McGuinnesses had two shops, but we take them one by one. The first shop was a pure, it was a lady shop. Like what I mean is it's all wedding dresses and ladies clothes specifically, like. Yeah. That's where I seen the bullock jumping in one wind and running out the door, bringing the door with him on a fair day. <laughs> well, that was McGuinnesses. And what it, it was McGinnis as, as it was now, as it is now, was it? Well, it's the same building, the same, same building, same and everything. Yeah, yeah, same structure completely. That okay. was the, the women's shop, like it's old, we'd say, like women's top coats and suits and wedding gear and that, all that. Mm. You went down then, next door was Maxwell's. Now, Maxwell's was a massive concern. Maxwell's were grocers, baking, they had a baking counter. They had a massive bar, oh. and down the yard there were wholesale bottlers. Like they bottled their own stout, they had a big yard. They could have ten men working in the yard. I can remember the caskets coming on the drays. Hmm. Like a dray, the drays were up in the CIE yard. Like a dray was a flat body pulled by a horse. And mallet down from Harbour Road, all the rest of them. 
and the little man Jimmy Rogers from the Park Road, they drove the drays. Stuff didn't come in vans or yeah, lorries, yeah, yeah. it came yeah. on the drays. Like. Oh. But Maxwell's would have been a massive concern and there were, there were wholesale bottlers and they had lorries on the road delivered into the pubs. The Monocle brothers from Ard, I remember driving the lorries for them. And I think one of the other Monocles actually worked in the bar and Peter Bourke worked in the bar, Billy Midlachlan was the manager and Mr Mulhern lived up over it. He he was the general manager. And actually where Annerley Park is built today, or the first section of Annerley Park, mm. would be built as we call Maxwell's Field. Yeah, Herbert, some of them villas to go way back like Yeah, Maxwell's That's Field. Like Mr Mulhern he would have keeping a lot of cattle and that in the field. Ah, right. But about 1968 or that it was sold and developed in Tonnelly Park. Yeah. That was Maxwell's Fields were part of Tonnelly Park. Then next door you had McGuinness's other shop, which would be a general mixed draper shop, both men's and women's like. Hmm. Jimmy Trott from Arda, he's still alive, he lives in Valley Mahan. He worked in I can definitely remember him working in it. Why it's all curtains like and bed linen and table covers like and men's yeah. clothes and women's. Why do you remember that though? Is it a character? Was he? Was he? Well, I remember. Well, I remember Jimmy Trot because years after he worked in Dorkins, oh. he wouldn't be too well. Maybe twenty years gone out of Dorkins. Like Jimmy Trot would be well in his eighties and a great man for his age and worked in Dorkins. Well, like at, later after yeah, McGuinness's. Yeah. And next door to McGuinness's, you would have Harney's Chemist. Like Harney's would have four shops in Lamford or that, but we went to that. But Harney's Chemist, uh, Dennis Dowd worked in it. And Johnny Kelly, Johnny the Yank, a very flamboyant character oh, on the town yeah, today, yeah. he was a messenger boy in it. Because a lot of shops, I was a messenger boy myself for a while, uh, a lot of shops had messenger boys. And uh, he would have been serving the three shops, three or four shops, because they had three or four. But Johnny and Dennis Dowd, and I can't remember, Mr. Harney himself and whatever other people, they were in it. Next door to that thing would be Shaw's. Shaw's had a small little shop. What would be there if Shaw's today? Well, Harney's and Shaw's would be Luigi's now, like. Yeah. Where Luigi's is now. Because when Luigi came first, he bought Harney's and then I think he bought Shaw's and extended it like. But Harney's and Shaw's, Shaw's again was a draper's. Like it was a small shop, but the draper's shops at that time had all little drawers. You'd often see them mm. in old films and that. And it was amazing in such a small I space. Are you served the amount of stock that they had, yeah. yeah are you being served yes. well now, yeah? That they were Shaw's. I, they lived over the shop, which an awful lot of shopkeepers did at the time. That mm. was common practice. And I think they had land out, I think they had land out in Killishy. And next door to that, then, well, as far back as I can remember, Joe Ward from Teffia Park, the Wards from Teffia, still children around, of course. Joe Ward had a butcher shop at the front. And Matt Tiernan's, or Tiernan's, had a pub at the back. Like when you went in the door, if you were going to the butchers, you turned to your left. If you were going to the pub, you went straight in. All like. oh, right. The right. And you mentioned the uh, messenger boys as well. Like, was yeah. That, like, were you with one shop, or if you were a messenger well, boy? Well, no. Like, well, Harney's would have three or four shops. So Johnny would sort of would have been a full time messenger. So boy. bring around supply to different shops. Yeah, like, and, and stacking shelves and that. Yeah. Like, okay, you know, okay, that yeah. was what a messenger boy was. Yeah, like. yeah. You had a messenger bike, a bike with a basket, with a yeah. an iron frame and a basket, and probably be advertising who you were. Who were you working the name of the premises yeah, that you were, yeah. you know. And if somebody rang on for a prescription or they done this or they done that, mm. you went and delivered it, like, yeah. within a certain area. And at that time, it would be common practice for stuff to be left at the station. So you, you'd go up to the station or that and collect one to be there, like. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. call it for yeah, yeah. like, like, what I mean is, I suppose. A message, you went in at the bottom as a messenger boy to start your trade as an mm. apprentice and you moved up and you moved up if so be. Yeah. So we're now at Hart's restaurant. Like that's before you go down. Hart's restaurant is before the alleyway. Before the alleyway. Before the alleyway. 
Now, some call it hearts, more call it drakes. But it was called hearts or drakes, and it was a big concern, like it was a big restaurant that had an up, that had a, an up the stairs as well now. Like they could have been doing 100, 120 dinners a day like at that wow. time, at that time. Because as we said, we will speak about there around, there was fair employment around. Mm. You had Hart's restaurant and you went down the gateway, which brought you on to St Michael's Road before the houses were built in Annelie Park. And on the gateway, you had Keenan's, there was Keenan's had a bookmaker's office, John Donlan, had a sort of a store in it where he'd store his cars and that, and there was Fallon's had, there was Fallon's would have a second hand, I'm sure there were Fallon's, they had a second hand furniture store further down. And Hart's restaurant and that, they would have keeping pigs and that. Mm. And they would have feeding the pigs with the offal from the restaurant, they'd fatten them up and they'd end up been told in the restaurant, if you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. They were there. You went then to next door then. You know where next door is like far side of the gateway yeah. was Waters's. I remember it as a Miss Waters, but she was Waters. And Desi Hines bought it then in the early. He only ended up, but he's still alive. No, he's not too long dead. I don't think he is. But Desi Hines bought it. He ended up buying a Donahoe's, a famous pub in Dublin, a Marion Row. Like everybody heard of a Donahoe's where the Dubliners and the World Tones would play mm. in that. Like, mm. You know, it's a famous landmark pub. Yeah. But Desi Hines bought it and he had it maybe for seven or eight years. And I think that he would have been the first in Lamford to sell cones. Well, cones. Yeah, cones. Yeah. I think now. Yeah. More of a contradiction, but I remember Desi, Desi having the cones. And it was a confectionery shop, a toy shop, and he sold souvenirs. Like souvenirs were a big thing at the time, like mm. because well, I mean souvenirs like little leprechauns of Ireland or the little things you shake because the, a lot of people would come home in the summer from England and they'd be bringing back souvenirs like to the people in England that they were mm. friendly with or whatever. But that's what Desi done, and Desi stayed there till about. Desi stayed there till about the early 70s, I'd say. He played, like I'd say, it was eight or ten years working in Desi oh. Hines' at that time. Like. Very busy, like. Yeah. And uh, a television crowd took it over then. McBurney's, I think, was their names. And it changed several times. But that was Waters' Desi Hines's. You went in next door, it was Paddy Horrigan's. Hmm. And Horrigan's had three shops or four of them, I think. But uh, Horrigan said the general dra uh, grocery, bacon, tea, sugar, dra pub at the back. And at that time, you see, they, all, all the grocers would have yard men because the sugar and the tea and all that came in tea chest. And it had to be weighed out boxes. in quarter pounds yeah. and half pounds or pounds. Yeah. And the meal would come, like. Yeah. And like there was chicken meal that come in ten, in ten stone bags, maybe. And there was people there to break them down into half stone bags because a lot of people around the town kept chickens and kept hmm. pigs, like. You know, chickens were coming around the houses in the town. People had hold them hmm. for eggs and for whatever yeah. after and hmm. they'd sell their pigs in the fair day. So that was Horrigan's, like. And you went next door then to where the chemist is today. You had... Uh, Cosgrove's, Seamus Cosgrove, they had a pub and they moved on, we'll say about 19, I don't know where they went, but they moved on about 19, well 1968 I think is the plaque and Kelleher's, when Kelleher's was established, Kelleher's bought it off, um, uh, off Cosgrove's. Cosgrove's and next door was Bernie, Barney Burns had a pub, a sort of a derelict pub, didn't do too much of anything at all, you know. Mm. He, he lived down on the on the laneway. There was houses down that Horrigan's Gateway, as we call it. Was there many houses like? Well, there were, he was about the only one that was living there at that time. Ah, right. But I do know that my grandmother, on my father's side, came from there. 
she was laying on her lane on, and they lived in that gateway, in Hurricane's gateway. And there was, there was about ten houses, but Barney, Barney Burns was the only one I can remember. Mm. And he done very little in the pub of anything at all, but he had a farm out the country. Mm. And he was a single man and he died off, and the Kellers then would have buy into two and breaking one into the other, where you have to carry chemists today. Uh, next door then was Camerton's. And Camerton's, as I told you before, my grandfather came to work in it. Camerton's was a massive, big, mixed draper shop. An awful lot of draper shops. Yeah, well, there was. It would be a lot more of them were finished. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Camerton's then was a big shop. And uh, men's, women's shoes and that. Like, they'd employ six, eight, ten people. Like, And it, we used to go into Camerton's and you were newfangled because if you paid for something here at the counter, mm. the assistant put it into a little jar and it went across the shop in a wire to the office yeah. and it was paid for in the office and it came back over again and you got your receipt and your change. Did you ever see them on the... No. Yeah. That's some yeah. system like something. Yeah, it was, yeah, that, there was a wire like. Yeah. And it went across the shop and it went to the girl in the office and it was blah 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 and she sent back the change in the receipt. Never heard of it before. Yeah. It different, yeah. Well, next door then, you had the bank where Anya's and that is now. I think it was the Munster Bank, but I'm just not sure, but it was the bank. Mm. The banks were there. Of course, the bank manager lived upstairs, and the bank, man the bank manager staying, do you see? The caretaker of the bank would always, part of his job would be to do the bank garden. The banks were always, had a big walled-in garden at the back of them, and they'd grow vegetables and fruit in them. But that was the caretaker's job to do the garden, that was part and parcel of his job. Like. Mm. And who was that for, for the bank? Well, it'd be for the people at the bank, like. It'd be oh. for the, the, the manager and his family. Well, if there was, there was a family, it wasn't just him himself. Like, yeah, he'd family, yeah. Now, but family and ah. whatever, like, yeah. But yeah. that would be part of your job, isn't it? No. If you were caretaker in the bank, like you'd done the garden as well. And next door to that, then, was Kenny's shop that's still there today. Another still there, like would have been a very upmarket draper shop at that time, Kenny's would be like. Kenny's would be very would have been very upmarket mm. draper shop. Next door then you had Mrs. Woods. Mrs. Woods, she had a daughter Mary, she's still alive. She lives up as you're going into Teffia there, like. We you turn in. You turned in that steel shop. Steel on the left, yeah. Yeah, she married a McGinnis man from Tarn and Barry. Yeah, the women are still alive. And uh, they had again paper shop, sweets, toys, all that sort of line like. That's where the. Uh, it's between Kenny's and where Ledwich's were. Ledwich's were then were next door. And Ledwidge's again sold toys and souvenirs and chocolate and cigarettes mm. and that like. And Ledwidge himself, that he lived with the mother there. He was an insurance agent. He's not too long dead. He lived on the house on the battery there as you turned down to Abbey Carter and football pitch. I know it's at the new house is there now. Yeah. That's where he ended up living. But that was Ledwidge's. And next door to that, then, you had Paddy Tracy's butcher shop. But previous to Tracy's, as far as I know, it was Mortal's Butcher Shop. Paddy Tracy, I think he was a Galway man that came to Lamford and he took over from Mortal's, bought it. Next door to that then, you had Joe Hagen. He was a bread man, he was a litre man, a very nice man. He had a little shop. Again, selling papers and sweets, and cigarettes and whatever. And pageants had a betting shop, a bootmakers, at the back of it, like. And then you had Kelly's Yard, as it was called, but we'll go to that later on. Next door then, between Kelly's Gateway, between O'Hagan's and Lamford Drugstore, which was Nugent's. It was a chemist. It was called Lamford Drugstore. That was Nugent's chemist. Then you had Joe Kelly's, Peter Kelly's, mm -hmm. and it, it was everything, like, I mean, it was hardware, 
you could be in a grocery pub and down they had a massive yard like mm. the sole building materials like cement, sand, blocks, the cut glass in it like sold coal, coal merchants, everything like they were undertakers as well of course mm. like. they still are yeah still are but, uh, yeah. they were actually the only undertakers in Lamford at that time with the exception of fees but we'll, we'll, we'll eventually end up with them that was Kelly's. Mm. You went in and you had the courthouse. Then you went to the Lamford Arms Hotel. And my first memories of the Lamford Arms Hotel would have been in the Yonley was similar. I can remember the doormen outside of the hotels, dressed in the brown suits with the gold beret on them. And they opened and closed the doors for the people going so in and out. in New York or something. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And if somebody pulled up on the street, Cars would be rare enough in the 60s. If somebody pulled up on the street, like they went and they took their luggage, they brought in their luggage, or brought out their luggage and that, like. Mm. And there were the doormen in the hotels, like the Andy, the first thing was the same. And <coughs> that was the Longford Arms. You went down Richmond Street then, we'd say, and you had the Longford Arms garage. Mm. It was a garage. It's still kind of there. Right? It's, it's still like, kind yeah. of there. Not yeah. get big employment. Huey Dye was involved in it, and a Kelly man from up at Fair of Fad, his daughter's married to Brian Plunkett out the road. Uh, they were Shear and Mr. McComiskey. They and Longford Arms Garage would have been a, a big concern at the time. Mm. And you went down then, and it was a place by the name of Sandy Row, where the flats yeah. are now. Like. Sandy Lane, yeah. Sandy Lane, I think it was Sandy Row or Sandy yeah. Lane. But it was a sort of derelict, but the houses were there, like. Mm. You went on down, you had Nevins, one of the Nevins here from Congress Terrace, had a joinery shop in it. He, he done it by himself or maybe one with him. You had Shannon's next door, which was another joinery shop. Next door to that, you had the furniture factory where I started off working. And we spoke about that the other yeah. day. Wheelands, was it? McNally and Wheelands, yeah. McNally Wheelands, yeah. Yeah, well, I think you have that, or I can yeah. tell you about it again. Oh, you can't, yeah, go far away. Stay together. Yeah, well, McNally and Wheelands was a big concern, like to be 35, 30, 35. When you say a big concern now, you mean a big. Well, be a good business, like. Yeah, 40. You don't mean a concern yeah. as in you were concerned that it was going to close down, or. Yeah, it? no. Yeah. It was a big concern. Like to be a bedroom furniture. Yeah. Though, when you say concern, you mean a good thing, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, yeah. 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 A large business, like yeah. I call it a concern. Yeah. 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 And uh, McNally and Whelan's were there, and I got into it when I was coming 16 years of age as an apprentice to serve me time, which would be a big thing, like, yeah. you know. And uh, I left school to go there, and uh, I would have been, I, I never settled in it really. Mm. I didn't want to be there, but I, I didn't want to go back to you school. Go back to school. <laughs> and, uh, like it was a golden opportunity because there was yeah. four different trades in the one factory. Like mm. there was cabinet makers, there was machinist and veneerist, and there was French polisher. Now a lot of them people that was in it formed their own when they closed on that. Mm. They have formed their own businesses. Like like a lot of people from around the town were very good trade. Like, like yeah. Danny O'Hara and Josie Williams and the Yotzes, like, and Raymond Masters, and then Michael Fitzmaurice, and Mick Pronty, and John McDonald that still makes furniture in Clondrad to this day, and Billy Tafe, and Noel Rogers, and Larry Riley from Teffy, and there was country lads there, the Clancy's were in it, and Mick Duffy, and Huey Clark, just to mention, I can't think of them all, or we're not going to. It was like, a good trail, it's it was a good trail. It stood with them. It was a great opportunity, it was a great opportunity for me to get Mm. at the time but you know I didn't avail of it mm. because I didn't like it and shortly after I went from having that opportunity to a job at Lifton Bins with Lamford County Council which would have been a very dirty hard job mm. but I was happy at the bins mm. and what I'm saying is it's very important to be happy at your work mm. you could be qualified up there mm. but you might want to do something down there mm. Like, you'd better be a builder than a barrister if you want to be a builder. Yeah. Because right. if you're not happy at your work, mm. y your head isn't right. Like You, you, know? like, the, you like the freedom and yeah. you seeing the whole the town and other spots. And I went on the Binlory for 20 years and I loved it. But anyway, that was McNally and yeah. Whelan's. 
And next door to that then was Pierce's garage. Pierce's had a garage. Now down where the ESB is, yeah. there now, well, what remains of the ESB, that was Pierce's garage. Pierce's was a big concern, like. They would have employed, I'd say, 20 people, like. Christy Warner worked in it, and Jimmy Cavill from Ballinalee, and Christy Dan, and Junior Norton would serve his time in it, like, and I can't remember that just off, and I can't remember them all, but it was a big garage, like Pierce's. And you went further down Richmond Street, then, where we'd cross over the far side of Richmond Street, yeah. like. The cottages were there. There were six cottages. Some of the people still live in them. We call them the cottages. Where the creamery is now yeah. would be on the site. And some of the people are still there. And Father Byrne, in the early 60s, bought one of the houses or got one of them off the council and he built the youth club for the working lads of the town. Like, well, not for the lads, for the girls as well, but he formed the youth club. Mm -hmm. They built some sort of a prefab building and uh, they set up a youth club for... The working class people in the town, like, and to be a dark board in it, like, and to be ring boards in it, and to be an odd hop, if you want to call it. It was a sort of a records playing, a little bit dancing. <laughs> yeah. Now, it, at that time, we would have been just looking in the window because we were too young to get in. Like, you yeah, come up further then, and the creamery was there, like. The creamery would have been ben very beneficial like, to the shopkeepers in the town because a lot of the farmers brought their meat in every day to the creamery. Like, they might have one can or a can or a can and a half or two cans. And when they came in there to bring their meat to the creamery every day, they done their little bit of shopping in the town in the mornings and that. Like, so the creamery would have been a big financial benefit to the shop. It looked like a big place. I've, see, I've seen it. It's yeah, the like now. It was like, yeah, it was a big place. Pretty big. The, John Slow used to bring milk into it, like I can remember him, he'd be out with a tractor throughout the country, like the yeah. collecting the cans and bringing them in and that, and John Galvin worked in it from, John Galvin worked in it there from Chapel Street, he said, now tell you who worked in it, Tommy Riley now, you know Tommy now that's around the town, like, you know that. Tommy, he owned a good bit of property that around the yeah. town, Tommy Riley, worked in the creamery too and uh, Michael from Ballon the League like they were all employing five, six, seven people like mm. I, you went up Richmond Street then and the houses was there the Keenans lived there and the Cassidys lived there and the Welches lived there and I can't remember then and then we go up a bit the vines were a big concern there were fowl merchants like fowl? Chickens. Chickens, oh yeah. yeah. they were fowl merchants, that was what they were called yeah. at the time. They were exporting fowl, England and that like. So they must they be went out big. through the country, they had lorries going out through the country buying chickens, buying fowl and buying eggs. They mm -hmm. brought them in, they were killed there, got ready, decked up and sent to England or sent all wherever like. Must they had, a big spot like. Yeah, they had a big, they had a big concern. And I think later on and they got out of the fowl and they got into pigs. Because they would lead on to Little Water Street, like. Mm. And they were a big concern, there were a couple working in it. And you went up then, Provider's Yard was there. Now, Provider's Yard was a massive place. Mm. Like, they had dealt in everything, like. Yeah, three floors they had, like. Yeah, well, not at that time, but mm. what I mean is, they dealt in everything in the building line, and they sold, mm. they sold sleepers, and they sold rail. They went to the north, and the, but when. The Great Northern Railway, some of them stopped, the Narrow Gauge Rail Railways. Mm -hmm. They went and they bought sections of the line and they brought back the sleepers and they brought back the rails and they sold them then to the farmers, like, yeah. for cash so that. They were into everything, like, as yeah. there were builders too, as well, like, built Asians and all that. They're still there, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was providers. You would up another little bit. There was houses then, there was there was Connachies, the Taylors, and there was Handleys and Mick Gillardin. Mick Gillardin, they lived there, he was, that's where he was there. And there was a pub then, by the name of Tommy Kelly's, it was a pub on Grocery. You went further up then, the Egan's were there. The Egan's were Hackney drivers, the house is still there, if you go down and look, you'll see the name up over. Between the Stillery pub, 
and where providers sell mm. the, the paint shop there, you'll see Egan's. Egan's were there. There were uh, there were hackney drivers and self-drive cars. Self-drive yeah, cars. Yeah, self-drive cars. If you came home, if you wanted a car for a couple of days, you could go to Egan's. Yeah. And they'd fix you up. They get you insurance and they get you everything. Mm. Like, and you hire the car for two days, one day, two days a week, a fortnight. And whatever. they covered all, like, as you said. Everything was done, yeah. Like. That's what they were at. Uh, they kept a lot of pigs out the back too and that and calves. They dealt with mm. pigs and calves as well. You would up then in Masterton's, where the distillery pub is now, was Jerry Masterton's. And they had an awful lot of self drive cars. They were into it in a massive way. And uh, that's where I would have gone down. I went to school with Jerry, it was very friendly. And you go down and watch his Ed Cars and Colombo or whatever it was, because they would have the television. Television when it was very we rare. Were very rare at the time. Yeah. That was the Masters. And so there's one of them still alive, she's a Mrs. Fallon out in. I think she's still alive. She's a Mrs. Fallon out in Clundra. And there's another one with Mrs. Killian in Clundra. Then you went up, you had Walter Maguire. He was a sugar merchant and uh, an auctioneer. He was from around Strokes Town or out around Sla, and he was there. And providers then, you went up, then providers, the original providers, now before they built what it is today, the building that's there, that the council yeah. have bought now, well, they, that would have been finished and built about 1969 or 1970. Oh. But they were previously there to that, oh, right. in a lot smaller scale. So we go down then to where the TSB bank is today mm -hmm. now. And uh, you had, a, as far back as I can remember, I think drums had a sort of a furniture store and a paint store. There were drums. And Pat Lynch had it after them. And you had a woman by the name of Lillian Gray. She had a hairdresser. She, had she married Arthur McDowell from... Newtown, we spoke about him the other day. That was there. And next door to that, then between the, you had the gateway, next door where the flower shop is today, now, mm. you had O'Connor's butcher shop. The Beef O'Connor, he was called. Oh, the Beef O'Connor. Yeah, he was capped for Ireland, like, oh. at junior level. He won a couple of international caps, I think, playing for Ireland. Soccer. Soccer, yeah. Yeah, and they were butchers. Mm. Next door to that, then you had traps as there is today. Oh, they were there back? Oh, they were there for generations, yeah. Next door to that, then, where Lyons' pub is now, mm. you had Frank Davis's. Now, Frank Davis was a man from Drumleash, and he had a pub there, and one of his daughters was married to Lal Donlan, famous Lanford Town goalkeeper. Oh, yeah. And his other daughter was married to Brendan Gill. Now, Brendan Gill, the Gills were fewer merchants and they had furniture on the square, we'll eventually get to them. They sold that, I would say, in the early 70s. And a man by the name of Jim Corker and the wife bought it. Next door then you had, you had uh, Grok Solicitors, as it still is today. But up the, up the gateway, yeah. There was a door and there was the, the gentleman's club it was called. Yeah. And the gentleman's club was up the stairs. It was a pub, it wouldn't open until maybe about nine or ten at night. That would have been in the backyard now. No, it would have been up oh. the stairs. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember as children we'd go up and peep in and see it. <laughs> and it was like come back, we'd say, to the eighteen nineties, like big sofas in it and the gentleman's club it was called. Yeah. You'd be one of the hobnobs to be a member of it. Yeah, yeah. And Sorry, I missed one, Vaughan's Butcher Shop, but I'll tell you about that later, yeah. Between Traps, no, between Davis's and, between Davis's and Grok's was Vaughan's Butcher Shop and Castles had stayed over it. Paddy Castles was a postman and it went on fire and was burned. And Vaughan's moved down then. Paddy Hurrigan previously had a grocer's in it. And Vaughan's moved into it as a butcher's. 
and that's where I used to go down after school and Saturdays for a while and any day there was no school to go down and do a few messages and clean the windows and do a bit of sweeping and clean up in the evenings and go over to the factory over the Lions for meat if it was wanted or that for the butchers. Then the stir one would have been a butcher in it and Harry Ryan or dressing would be another one. Mm. And De Liam there one. That was where Butler's is now, is his solicitor. Next door into that, you had some sort of a finance crowd came for finance for cars or that. And the manager of it was a fella from off here, Cavan. This would be the early 60s. And he was the, the manager of it. I know he won in All Ireland, I think, with. I think he won in All Ireland with Offley. Greg Kelly or something was his name, but then I'm open for contradiction. But I remember that being next door to the butchers. And the next door to the butchers again, then you had Mel Early. Mel Early had a draper shop okay. and he was a tailor. Yeah. Now that's Jimmy Early today and Luke and Paddy that goes round on the bike. And there were two sisters in it. That was Early's. They were then there. Next door to that, then you had next door to here, you had uh, Maguire's solicitors. Then you had the town club, like it's vacant there today. This side is Sean Dawson. I heard about that before, yeah. I think yeah. Oregon told me about that. Yeah, the town club. Yeah. And the soul that they're in, the, I think, in the 80s and they moved out to flank here or the yard today or whatever you want to call it now. But the town club would have been a very lively spot. There was snooker tables up the stairs like. Two snooker tables. Mm. And downstairs then on the down the stairs there would be what was called Pongo would be played. It was a forerunner to bingo. It would be played on a Saturday night and on a Sunday the Clamford Town weren't playing at home. It would have been well, it'd be one of their ways of raising money, like, to keep the, the pitch going, like, you know, or to keep the, the club going. Plus, the soul, there was club tickets to be sold around the street on the Saturday. And you went down on the Sunday morning to the club window, and there was a board up with the numbers, like. Uh, it was, I think the first prize, first prize was £5, which would be a lot of, a lot money. of money. And I think £2 and three one pounds like. Don't forget, now, the tickets are only sixpence a piece. That's good money, you know. They were giving out a tenner, so if you make it up, they had to sell an awful lot of tickets, but yeah. they did, because the soccer had unbelievable support in the town. Yeah. That was a town club. Next door to that then was Mel Gillard's. This is the first chip shop, is it? Yeah, yeah Mel yeah. Gillard's, it would have been... Uh, it's right in the corner, it, would it be? No, it wouldn't be at the corner. Mel Gillard's was there, it was a bit of a confectionery shop, maybe light bakery. Or like a uh, like grocery. He yeah, had a chip shop, sold chips. It was just chips, there was nothing else on me chips. Yeah. You got me talked about. But he had a record with jukeboxes it was called uh, in the corner. And it was six pence of spin like. And everybody been playing records. Like. What records you'd have about them? And well sure, what records would we have with of the day? Well of course Elvis would be the yeah. man anyway and the Beatles. Like we're talking nineteen up to 1966, 68. Yeah. And now, would this be in a where people would be talking about this, like, probably weren't happy with it, like? Oh, no, I was yeah, sure it closed at 11 o'clock. Yeah. It closed when the picture house closed. Yeah. What I mean is, every night when the cinema was over, 10 or 15 minutes after the cinema would be over, Gillard and the chip shop would close. You wait for that crowd and then you wait for the crowd coming out of the cinema yeah. with the audience. So then, the next shop then was Mick Fox's Butchers. That's now where that girl has the hairdressers there today yeah, before you go down yeah, Little yeah. Water Street. Yeah. You had Mick Fox. And at the side of that, I think you had a butcher shop previous to that on the bridge, but at the side of that, as you went down Little Water Street, there was a pub by the name of the Gaelic Park Bar. And the man that owned it, or owned it at one time, he sold it on to somebody, and he went and he bought a pub in Dublin. And it was a famous pub in Dublin. I, rem I think it was Riley was his name. He had the Gaelic Park Bar. A very few people I'd say remember it. But I, I, I can remember being in it with my father as a child. And I'll tell you why. Because the Dempsey's from Water Street 
no more than other people, always kept a cow on the domain. The people in the town would keep a cow on the domain. You know where the domain is, don't you? Domain, yeah, yeah. You're down at the bottom of water. You keep walking down Little Water Street as far as you come. The dog pound is on your right there. Yeah. Right. And there, for as far as you can see, that would have been part of the domain. Hmm. And the people kept cows on it, like, for me, for the house yeah. and whatever, like, or... So people the shearer? Or... No, uh, several people, like the Dempsey's yeah. and the Maguire's and cows on it, and Maureen Reynolds would have a cow, and Sissy Hackett would have a cow or two on it, and other people that have cows that I can't remember. But on Little Water Street then, we're going down Little Water Street down to the main, there was three or four houses like that nearly would have been a sort of derelict. But, well, they were very old houses like. And uh, there, was an, there was an Allen man lived in them. Tommy Allen lived in one of them. And uh, Brian Gadish used to live in one. He was a cattle dealer, cattle jobber like, drover. Uh, Little Tommy Green lived over the far side in one, and the Dempseys and Deegans and that had a lot of the sheds, and they kept pigs and calves and whatever in them sheds, like, but there would have been no industry down there at that time mm. until the late 60s, till Tool and Plastic, that's where Tool and Plastic would have their first factory, as far as I know, was down where where they make the galvanized sheep in today. Where, On the left, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that would have been the only thing that was down there, and Paddy Rita kept greyhounds down there and so did you or all. So that would have been Little Water Street mm. for you. Was there uh, something just when you went down Little Water Street on the right hand side, there seems to be some old that was the house. Well that's what I'm coming up to now. Yeah. We're coming back up Little Water Street now up onto the bridge and Maureen Reynolds. There was a, it was literally a four story house. Mm. There was a basement and three stories over it. You'll see photographs of it. It was a massive house. And Maureen Reynolds owned it. And she kept, it was a lodging house. Ah, right. And she kept a lot of lodgers, particularly out of Lyons' meat factory. Mm. Because a lot of the lads from Lyons' came from the south of Ireland. Because the manager in Lyons' at the time was a man with the name of Paddy Kelly from Newcastle West. And he would bring up a lot of the lads, like, mm. to work in the butchers in Lyons's. Mm. And how I know so much about him was when he'd be going home every third or fourth Saturday, he'd give my grandfather a lift with to Ratkeel because my uncle lived in Ratkeel. My uncle uh, Colin Gorman. And uh, that was Maureen Reynolds as I say she kept the lodgers and blah 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 and the house was knocked down I don't know, but I'd say in the early 70s, like, it was, you'd never see the photographs of it or not. No. But just no. around, they're easy to get. That's Actually, okay. I think there's some of them up in them in Farden's window, Maureen Reynolds's. That's the vacant spot where the car park yeah. is. You went over the bridge then, and you had the Odeon Cinema. Mm. And next door to the Odeon Cinema, Huey Dyle owned it. He had flats in it. But a man by the name of uh, Paddy Cohen, I think, for a short while, had a second-hand clothes shop in it. Next door then was Lyons' pub. But I don't know... Now, that's the Lyons' that have the pub on Main Street today. Mm. But I don't know who was there before them. You had Lyons's. And next door then you had Mary Egan. I think it was a butcher's previous, that Mick Fox was in it, but Egan's ran some sort of a bed and breakfast in it. And you went down the gateway to Lyons' factory. And as you went to the factory, was down there, but on the right hand side, Hopkins has had a blacksmith's. Like Louis, Louis was the woman, and I can't remember the man's name, Bill. And he showed horses. And he made gates and railings and done welding and all that. Like that was Hopkins's forge, that's called it. And he came up over there, the next door then was the press office. The evening pep the evening presses used to come in at around two o'clock from Dublin. But there was a blind space. There was two blind spaces on the front page. And it the door to get the evening news here to be to be printed or partially printed the front uh, page would be finished off in Lamford. And the Donlins then would distribute the papers all through the west of Ireland. 
went through a lot of the west of Ireland and over through Leitrim and that. There were four or five vans going with the paper. The evening press was finished off. Is that there. the same Donalds that are still doing that today? Yeah, the same Donalds. Oh. Yeah, that lad's yeah. father and grandfather yeah. and uncles. Okay. That has the horrors today. Then you had the castle. At that time, Lyons has had the castle and they use it as a store. And Mick Ford, the man from Legion Terrace, done the garden. And do you remember much about the castle at all? Do you I know? remember being in it because I'll tell you why I was in it. Because when I was in the butchers, if I wanted coats for the butchers or if I wanted tools or if I wanted knives like or anything like that, they were all stored in the castle. And you had to go over to the castle and Mr. O'Halloran, his daughters are still alive to this day, they worked on the council. Mr. O'Halloran was an old ex guard and he was over the, the, the distributing of the clothes and whatever, like, whatever was to be got for our lions or whatever, you went to him and you got it, like. Mm. Then the castle was knocked down. Uh, do you remember uh, any details about it, what it looked like inside? Oh, Jesus, well, I can still see photographs of it, but it yeah. was literally derelict, like, you went up, oh, you went up two sets of stair or steps. It was all kind of stone and, and blocks. Again. Now, I'd be only in the front room, they were only yeah. on the downs end of it, like, where he had the store, and yeah. he'd be there, like, but it would have been falling down inside, like. Oh, okay. But strange enough, I can't remember it being knocked. Mm. Like, you know, it was a big event, I suppose, but I just mm. can't remember it being knocked. But it wouldn't be knocked overnight. That was that. And mm. then in the barracks, like the barracks, the FCA were in the barracks. Mm. And there was a couple of families lived in the barracks. But uh, That's how a lot of people came to, to live in Longford was through the barracks. Yeah, well that was later now. Yeah, I'm talking one, before yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, Drums yeah. and scanlons and the FCA would have camps and shoots in it practices on a Sunday morning. And there'd be basketball played in it, like in one of the I remember doing basketball, I remember being at a, a weekend blitz of basketball in it, like one time we were over looking at it. That was the parish, sure all keep a couple of grounds in it. And mm. then in the late sixties or the early seventies the soldiers came. Right? Yeah. And you were further up then if you would just go up the back well, you're on Church Street now. Mm. And where the Labour Exchange well it, where that building is now, on your left hand side on Church Street, it was Firstly, it was built as a labour exchange, but previous to that, the labour exchange was down where Geraghty's are now, because Geraghty's offices are four and five Church Street, but they only owned it one of them. And previous mm -hmm. to that, that was a labour, the labour exchange was there. And the ESB had their offices and their depot there now where Connells have the funeral home, mm -hmm. right? And we went further up then, we went up to the ribbon factory, we got up to the ribbon factory. Mm. And the ribbon factory, as we spoke previous, like, were big employers, Hirsch Ribbon, or Goebbels, like they were all the one, they were Hirsch's or Goebbels's. And they were big employers, I'd say there would have been 60, 70 people, but a lot of them, maybe I'd say two thirds of them would have been women, like, mm. a couple of men there for fixing machines and that, mm. like, and that was there. The old technical school was there as it is today, like, mm. and the hospital. So we come back down then, all right? Yeah, yeah. Work you come down then Keep to going. the church, St. John's Church. Yeah. You had the church, but down the laneway, you had fees. And fees were coffin makers. Now, there were massive employers in Longford in the early 19th century. You can read about them, like, you, the bridge, actually. If you go over the new bridge to the council bridge, you read the history of fees, like, mm. I think, Mrs. Turner would have been one of the fees, but they were somewhere connected. But I can remember going over for the sawdust for the butcher shop, like because oh, the butcher shops at that time were always had sawdust on the floor, like. Yeah. And I remember going over to fees. Eamon Lennon was working in it. Now that's Martin's father, like. He was there making coffins. And John Carroll of Legion Terrace and Jerry Farrell from Clondra spent his time in it. And it was burned to the ground then, I think, in the I don't know, was it in the late 70s or whenever it burned, there was a fire in it. And that has sort of finished that. Now the houses are there today as you go down to Sullivan's the dentist and that. Mm. That would have been fees. And the, the mill was there. And uh, 
Next door to that, then, when that born David Lennon moved down here and he progressed from one to the other, he wouldn't have been an undertaker originally, I think. He would have been a coffin maker. And then he got into the undertaking, I think. But uh, fees were the coffin makers. And you come up the gateway then, we're coming up, we say, heading for the town again. The library was there. Longford County Council Library was where the accountants is there now, like. You know where the accountants yeah, are? Yeah, yeah. That was the library. Was it a small one? Like oh, there? Jesus, no, it was a big library. Like, yeah, Miss, McC Miss McCann was Miss McCann was one of the... She was the head librarian, a small little woman. She lived under battery. Breach Cassidy, or Breach Degan, as far as Sean Cassidy, she worked in it, and Mary Rayleigh, but that would be in later years. Mm -hmm. And the council had offices upstairs, like. Mm -hmm. It was the council offices, some of the council offices were upstairs. Then you had Connellans as solicitors, and as I said, you had the Labour Exchange and you had Geraghty's to this day. And then there was houses, and the hall is still there, St John's Hall. And you came round the corner then, let's say, and you had Mollons and Ross. And you had the tax office was there someplace. That's where the tax office was, for tax year car, was on Bridge Street. And the Kyo's lived there. Flash Kyo, and that's Tommy Kyo today now, and his daughter Anne Jenkins, and uh, Willie Kyo that lives out in uh, lives out in Ballinalee. They would have been all rare there on that street. And there was a man by the name of Nickel Hughes. He was a uh, Nickel Hughes was a barber, small and stout man. He had a bar little barber shop there. And you went further on then, and there was Miss Condley's, two Miss Condley's, and they had, I can remember going down the steps into it, they had a little sweet shop, a confectionery shop, and cigarettes and that, because there was, I told you, it was vast, an awful lot of people all around that area. You had lines as big factories. Yeah, you know, lines well, you had a lot of them, yeah. and you came down another little bit then, and there was a jeweller's shop, and a hair, or maybe it was a hairdresser's or a jeweler's, I think the name of it was, MacDade's. And Jimmy Masterton ended up, J Jimmy Masterton was in it up until about 30 years ago, watchmaker. And they were jewelers or watchmakers. And next door to that then you had Miss Walsh. Again, she had a little sweet shop, a confectionery shop and that. You had the bridge. And then you came down, you're coming down from the bridge where Fenlands is now, mm. you had Hackett's Television Shop, it was called. They sold all electrical appliances. There were televisions were coming in and that, that would be the rare thing. But Walter Hackett, he had a television shop, so televisions, radios, electrical appliances. And did he rent them out? That was a big thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah they could be rental, purchase or rental. Yeah. First of all, we ever had there was rental. And uh, next door to him was Paddy Daly. Paddy Daly had a second-hand clothes shop and he used to go over to England in a van or to Scotland and buy, buy bales of clothes and uh, he done a big trade in second-hand clothes at the time, both men's and women's and children's. Pick a mess, you never know what you get. Like, you never know what you get in it. Like. Yeah. But we, I, remember buying, I remember we got our first football boots in it like. Yeah. Because you get a good pair of boots off Paddy Daly, which might be £2 someplace else, you get them for maybe... 10 shillings or 15 shillings yeah. and you go down and put an installment on them it'd be left there mm. and you went down and you got them like but he had a second hand clothes shop and you were down Water Street then right mm. still with me you were down Water Street and you had the, the what's this the bar was I think it was the Trav the Travers Rest was the name of it it was Philip Smith's when it was burning there that was the Traveller's Rest. He was a fellow by the name of Mick Liddy that had it. He was a cabin man, a building contractor as well. And he would have selling it to Donohos or to Donovan's. Paddy Donovan would have come and then in the late 60s, I would say, and bought it. Mm -hmm. Next door to him then you had Billy Dempsey. With uh, Billy Dempsey had the shoemakers there next door. And uh, I remember he bought in a machine it was a very up-to-date machine at the time for finishing off shoes and doing shoes and that taking a lot of the handwork out of 
fixing shoes. And to this day, that machine is still out in the museum in Arda. If you ever go out, you'll see it. Mm. And it says, done yet yeah, by Mrs. Dempsey, like. That would have been a big thing to have that machine at the time, like, mm. you know. Would have been a big step forward. Next well, that door. would make, make shoes cheaper, though, would it? Well, no, well, he wasn't making shoes. He was uh, only mending shoes. Mending, like. yeah, yeah, okay. But it finished them off, like, and it, it left it easier. It left your job easier anyway. Like, yeah. It was a sort of a finishing machine, it was yeah. called. Yeah. And uh, next door to that, then, you had Hackett's bicycle shop. And uh, that's where all the... See, bicycles were a big thing because an awful lot of people had bicycles. And don't forget, like... There was no school. There was no free school transport until I think the late sixties. And a lot of the lads that used to come into the tech, you could be some people were saying walk. they had ten miles. You often heard of grandparents talking about a walk and ten yeah. miles, twenty but, miles. Well, they didn't have bikes. Yeah. And bikes were in demand, so bicycle shops were in big demand. Talking black nellies now, is it? Yeah. And yeah. there was two or three people working in high, yeah. in Hackett's bicycle shop, as it was called. Next door to that, then. Next door to Hackett's bicycle shop was Sissy Hackett. Sissy Hackett kept a lodging house, let's call it. Mm. And she kept she kept a couple of cows at the back of it, and she kept chickens and that. And she kept lodgers. And next to her then was a woman with a Miss Fardell, and then you had Gorman's, my grandfather and grandmother. They were there. My grandfather was a tailor there. And I can remember specifically on a Saturday, he worked the whole day and early Saturday for the for Cooney's at a man shop. Cooney's was that busy a shop at that time, like we get to go to Cooney's later mm. on. Mm. And I remember often having to come up on a Saturday, I'd be running up and down all day with trousers as with little notes on them, take two inches off them or let down this or do that, whatever. You'd be afraid you'd let them drop, <laughs> brand new suits like. Yeah. And uh, I remember I had to come up to my mother and not having said my grandfather wanted her below to give him a hand. My mother was a seamstress, like. And next door to that day, to Dempsey or to Gorman's, you had Lennon's Cafe, or McCarran's if you wanted to call it that. It was a sort of upmarket cafe, they did not often trade in dinners and teas mm -hmm. and that. Then you had Maguire's, and you went on down a little bit, Pat Lynch had a furniture store, and in the late. Pat Lynch on the present Pat Lynch is still a furniture. He had a furniture store in the late fifties and it went it was burned. He had a furniture store there and you went down then you had Halpins. There was a vacant spot where it was a yard, it's still there like it's used to keep a lot of cattle in it. And when on the day of the kill they'd be brought up to be all marched up the street like and down the yard to be killed. They had that it's still there lying vacant. You had Halpins. And Halpins were foul merchants, like, mm. again, something similar to the Vines and the Camons. And they gave great employment, and particularly at Christmas, a month or two before Christmas, like, for the English market with the turkeys and that, yeah. like. And they went out through the country collecting cattle or collecting uh, chickens and eggs and turkeys at Christmas and fe feds or whatever you had, like, geese and that. And they gave fierce employment, and a lot of the young people that left school which it was me aunts, I'm sure, I mean, them, they worked in Halpins. And uh, they employed a lot of people, Halpins did. And you went further down Water Street, then. You went further down Water Street and the abattoir was there, the local abattoir. Because the local butchers killed in the abattoir at the time. There was maybe 10, 11 butchers in the town. Yeah. And they'd kill maybe two, three evenings a week. Oliver Keenan and Billy Wellman would be there at that. But just killing the order, like yeah, whatever well, it is. They, 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 they killed for the butchers, like, that's yeah. so much. I mean, yeah. we'll say a man O'Brien could have a couple to be killed, or butchers could have, yeah. but they killed them every week. We just say Tuesday and mm. Thursday evenings, or Monday and Thursday, or whenever, mm. like, killing cattle and sheep, and whatever. And uh, you went further down then, and the skin, the tannery was there, or the mm. skin yard, if you want to call it, like. Pierce Michael Nerdney from the Park Road. He was the man that would have been involved in the reform of the rugby club. He was the boss over. And there could be 12, 14 working in the skin yard, like, with lorry drivers and that, like. You know, the sort of actually, I think your father might have worked in the yeah, I, think, I think he mentioned that, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a tough old work, yeah. 
the Gibbons has worked yeah. in it, and Paddy McDonough and Paddy Cassidy and a grey man from St. Chapel Street there, Derby Gray's father drove the lorry for them. And you wouldn't tell any of that today now, be honest with you. There's no Americans, there's not many Americans of any of them kind of buildings or what went on. Yeah, yeah. well, next door to that, then the Muldoons lived, they were plumbers. Old Paddy Muldoon. And uh, the gas works, I did the gas works because apparently when the first lights came to Lamford, there were gas lights and mm. somebody would run at night. At like enough time, I lit them, and it was the gas works was down there as well. But I can't remember that. But then we can come up Water Street. I remember yeah. all that was on Water Street, like the the Finns was on it, and the Mal uh, the Malones and the Cannings and the Kellys, like and the Tafes and all them, like were on down that side of Water Street. The Greens, and they were all houses. You come up then to Kiernan's. Kieran's had a big house, they had a shop, again they sold groceries and sweets and that, and they had a paint yard next door, a spray yard, like where they painted lorries of the day and vans of the day, like with the markings on them like that one there that's put on with stickers, yeah. they were painted on it that day. Yeah. At then sign people, sign right? writers, sign writers, sign writers. Yeah. Sign writers. But, there was a big family in Kieran's and there were painters, there were big painter contractors around Longford and around other areas. And you come up then and you had the Gary Owen. The Gary Owen was another pub, like. It was owned by a man by the name of John Paul that I remember owned it. He lived on the Dublin Road and not dead too long. Must be an old man when he died. But John Paul or John Napoleon was his name. I remember my grandfather be down in the down doing up the the suits or the trousers and that, they get them ready for the people for Sunday and it could be 10 o'clock or half 10 on Saturday night. Again, you get down there to get a couple of bottles of stout or whatever you're going to have. You go to the Gary Owen or you go to the Kruskeen Lawn, which was Lyons as the bridge. But uh, the pub was there and you come up to his houses there and uh, me and the McCoppins were there, they were painters. Mrs. Doog now that's still alive in uh, Mrs. Dugan Chapel Street, I don't know, do you know her? No. Well, it's here on the street there with her son Eamon and she'd be very old stock, water street stock now. She'd be a very interesting woman to talk to because she would have been very friendly with my mother and my aunts and them because her and Biddy Murray and all them would have been reared mm. and the Quinns like, uh, the Gaffneys like, they'd be all reared together on water street like and all around the one ages. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you come up, them houses were there, and uh, you come up then to two masters, it was a saddler masterson. Like, his trade was, his trade was like, we'd say, fixing ta horse tack, like, and that, like, you know. That's what it was. Well, a good trade back then. Yeah, he was a saddler, because there was a lot of horses yeah, and yeah, asses yeah. and ponies and carriages. Different all of them, different practice, and, and and this, this, that, that, yeah. yeah. He was there, and his brother John then was next door. He was a cobbler, mm. the same as Billy Dempsey and me father. And, and what them cobblers done at that time, believe it or not, although you would imagine they were in opposition, they weren't. One would oblige the other. If one was busy and the other wasn't, and a person wanted a pair of shoes in a hurry, they'd say, well, could you go over to John Master and John Master and do them, or come up to Jimmy Dempsey or go to Billy Dempsey or Paddy O'Hara, whoever it was. They shared the Lord. They, they the shared the Lord, like, you know. Well, there'd have been an opposition yeah. or a sort of a co-op, like. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came up then, that was, that was more or less it. There were all houses then. Ina Naylor was there and that. And you come up then and Brady Brown opened up a second hand clothes shop. I, I can remember the building lying in Derlick, but I, I can remember him coming too. But that would have been later on, maybe in the late 60s. Mm. So that was Water Street. So you come up again then onto the Main Street and you had Malone's, Malone's Bakery. Ginny Malone was there and had a bakery up. Ginny Malone's Bakery, that bakery at the front shop selling soda cakes and brown cakes and apple tarts and buns of all descriptions and they had the bakery up the gateway, up the, up the post office gateway as we call it. But Jeannie was there living and her brother Peter, he would have been buying cattle at fairs 
and that for the butchers of the town. That was his. He would be a cattle buyer, like for the butchers. Is that gateway is still there. So the gateway is still there. there. Yeah, that, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was Malone's. And next door to the, that, then next door to Malone's, you had well, Mary's or Cassidy's, whatever you want to call it. It was it was Cassidy's and Jimmy Mary married Alice Cassidy, and they had a little again. They had a little sweet and confectionery shop and sold cigarettes and minerals and ice cream and ever goes with it like. And uh, yeah, that was that. The two daughters are still alive and live in Water Street today, like the Marys. Well, Joe, yeah, I don't know, do you know Joan? And uh, the other Gary Catherine, you see her going around the town, she's bad in the side of the stick. She be yeah. yeah, well they, they, I would have been her old certain school the one day actually. And uh, the amazing thing about it is she'd know everybody by their voice on the street like. Mm. If you meet her in the street and say, How are you John? How's it going? Or she'd say, How are you Kevin? Or uh, not John Catherine, she'd say, How are you Kevin? Or she'd say, How are you you know, she gets to know people by mm. her voice. But that I was the think that same lady goes into the, the flowers now, uh, down that end of the street. He goes in for a cup of chai and Yeah, she would. They get yeah, with the yeah. cane and that and that. Yeah, I think I know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was Mary's and Cassidy's. And as I told you, Benoit said the bakery up the gateway. Then you had the man shop that we spoke about, mm. Coney's, like Kevin Trapp. I remember the f he's the first one I remember working in it, like. Kevin Trapp would have been working in it, that he'd be trapped from over the shop, and he would have served in his time in it. In Michael Coney's. That was a big shop, like. Very busy shop, and yeah. Jim Kelly from Deputy Park opened it later on. Then you had the post office, like. Next door to the post office, then. Next door to the post office, then you had the multi craft. The multi craft was. He was a Sheehan man. He's still alive, I think. He was a photographer, like. Mm. And when you were making your Holy Communion or your confirmation, you went to him. He'd done weddings, like. Mm -hmm. And uh, you went down to him, you were brought down to him, and you got your photograph taken, like. When you were making your Holy Communion, or you went him or to lot. Do you remember that experience? Do you? I remember, yeah, but where they are now, but I remember getting me uh, the photograph to me when I made my confirmation or something, but I don't know where it is. Uh, you went and you got your photograph taken with him, and he done weddings and that. He's still alive and lives in Farnham Hill, I think. And uh, next door to that then, well, you had a dentist upstairs and you had Mick Flaherty. You had Higgins the dentist, up there was a door. You had Higgins as the dentist and Mick Flaherty was a barber up the stairs. But next you went to Gahan's. And Paddy Gahan, he had moved, I think, from Bridge Street over. Gahan shop was a sort of divided in two. Mrs. Gahan had a hairdresser. And Paddy Gahan had the second hand shop. Again, he dealt in second-hand clothes and he went on to the fairs. There wouldn't be too many markets at the time. He went to the fairs and the markets and that, and he sold the clothes, like to the farm and community or whatever. Or he went into the shop and you bought them, like. That was Gons. And next door to that, then, you had Whelan's chemist. Next door to that, then, you had Mr. O'Rourke. He was an insurance agent. Like for cars now, specifically. Mm. As far as I know, it was only for cars. Mr. O'Rourke, we used to do after school, we'd call him to see, do you want any messages done? And he, uh, he'd he get you to get him messages and get him tobacco or get him whatever he wanted and we'd clean the windows for him and that and he'd give you two shillings or a half a crown or whatever. Like Next door to that, then it's closed now. I don't know what was the last thing in it, but you, you might have remembered this in a restaurant or whatever. But Barney McLean opened up a big supermarket in it in the early 60s, about 64 or 65. Would have been the first big supermarket that would have been in Lamford. And uh, there was a lot of people working in the Midlands. It was a supermarket. Modern at the time it was up its speed. Very big. Like and I remember every month he'd have a sort of special offers and that. And he sent for John Joe Brennan would go down, he'd be looking for us. Thursday was a half day in the town. The shops used to close on a Thursday. Why Thursday? Well, well there was half days in every town. Well, yeah, well, why? Well, everybody... Why on a Thursday? Well, why not Thursday? Yeah. 
Yeah, you, exactly you, what happens. Usually you say that on a Friday today, isn't it? Well, it's kind of a half day on a Friday. You finish early on a Friday. Ah, well, that's... But, I mean, at that time, the half days would have been from Monday to Thursday because Friday would be busy. Yeah, yeah. But the Lamford's half day, a close and a half day, it was... Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. And actually, you might laugh at this, I still think it's to be got, but I know it used to be on it. All Moors, it's a book that comes out, All Moors, this kind of... Alamac. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, cool. On that, it always gave the fairs and events, and it gave the half days, that was oh. half days, <laughs> and actually I think we call it whether it was a half day in Killashie. Yeah. yeah, it was on All Moors, yeah. like that was a half day in Killashie. But anyway, we'll go back to the half days. Yeah, yeah. He'd come looking for us, or he'd tell us come down, he'd meet us. And we'd go deliver them flyers for him. Like that, he, he specials. He was before his time, like, he'd mm. get these flyers printed. We went around, we put them through the doors in the town, and Teffia Park, out the Dublin Road, up the Battery to an extent, all down to Meldon Road, mm. Harbour Road, St Michael's Road, all that, put them into the. American you know, Hunters. <laughs> yeah, something was from tomorrow. Yeah. Six eggs were such a price, or a batch loaf was such a price, or a pound yeah. of rashes, or a pound of sausages. And we put them in. I remember he'd give us, like, don't forget, you're talking about 1965, 66, he'd give us 10 shillings each, a 10 shilling note, <coughs> for delivering the flyers. That was Barry Bidlin's. Next to him, you had the solicitors, then you had Black's Butcher Shop. Mm. I think it was McNamara's before that, but I can remember the Blacks. Blacks were people that came from Cavan, they had several shops in Cavan, and Brian Flynn, Brian Flynn was the butcher in it. I think he ended up owning it, but he came as a butcher into Blacks. And Blacks, as sort of as butcher shops went, were a sort of before their time, they had a fridge and they used to sell, they had chips in the fridge, like, I mean, crinkle chips and peas and uh, fish fingers and that. Like, they would have been nearly the only butcher in Lamford that had that. Mm -hmm. But I specifically remember, on a Friday, everybody, Friday was what you call a fast day. Nobody yet mm -hmm. meat or very few people at that time. It was fish day. Uh, yeah, you yeah, might not have it anyway. Yeah. But uh, Friday was fish day. Yeah. And I remember sometimes before I'd go to school, I'd have to go down to queue up, like, I can remember the boxes outside the door, the water running out of them, where the, the lorries, the fish lorries would have dropped on them on their way to Dublin, we'd say, the Donegal bus, uh, mm. to be coming from Donegal to Dublin. And I can remember the boxes, and you'd go and queue up, and I'd get them for my granny in Water Street, or I'd get them here for my mother before I'd go to school. Mm. That was Black's Butcher Shop. You know where it is now? Yeah, yeah. And next door to that, then, I don't, can't remember, I think it was King's, but I can't remember. But Quinn Call came, or Quinn Works, in night, about the middle, I'd say about 1964, that. Were and they were big back then, like the one, oh, they were massive. Big shop in the They were massive, they sold yeah. literally everything from a needle to an anchor, oh. and gave fierce employment in it, an awful lot of, a uh, couple of yard men, but there was a world of girls from around the town mm. worked in, in Quinn Works, like. And the first sign of Christmas was, Santy would come, <laughs> we'd make sure we wouldn't be at school that day. Okay. Santy would come the nearest Friday to the 8th of December. He'd come into Dublin Road in the lorry, like throwing out presents and sweets to the children, like, and yeah. down into the shop, and that's the thing the start of Christmas. I think Joe Coffey from, from uh, Tefia Park used to be Santy, like, yeah. and you go and you if you will at the head or whatever, you might be brought home and get your photograph taken, whatever yeah. like. But that was the first sign of Christmas, Santy coming to Quinnworth's mm -hmm. life. That was because so saw and everything, I remember. Oh, busy end of the town, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could win like you could get six months worth of broken biscuits or broken chocolate. Broken biscuits, I heard that talk about yeah, yeah, broken yeah. biscuits, broken <laughs> chocolates. They saw and everything in it, like ties, souvenirs. Basins, buckets, like mops, all that stuff. Yeah. Like. There was a big upstairs in it as well, like massive area, Quinnworth. Yeah. Soap, toiletries, all that. Like. Must be no new to you, like looking at the other street and the next thing here is this big Yeah, shop, there like. would be something now to that Pat Quinn. You know, Pat Quinn, Quinnworth ended up, uh, mm. they, they'd be one of them, like they were leads from people. They were there and you know, I remember there was a toy shop, when they came first and they opened the shop, there was another little toy shop beside it and they eventually bought it. And I remember 
to put the two into the one, like, and the left half is the toy section in Quinworth's, like. And you would open up then, and you had Mick Hanowins. Mick Hanowins would have stayed with Maureen Reynolds. He was a man from up around the border. And uh, he had a hardware shop. He sold furniture and he sold hardware and he sold delf and glass and that. He was there. And next door to that then was Corcoran's chemist. Like it's just, it's only two years closed, but Corcoran's would have been gone out of it. I don't know. The, medic, the medical hall, I think, was there. It wasn't, no, maybe. But it was Corcoran's chemist. And I remember we'd be brought down. We'd be brought down maybe twice a year down to Corcoran's chemist to get a bottle. People have great, they made up their own remedies and that. And people get these bottles like for children and that, or cough bottles. And remember when you go in mother or daughter a bottle of this or a bottle of that, you look what she tell you. Oh, they got for a cylinder one and nine. But remember he give you, he give you a big teaspoon, a big soup spoon of stuff to take like, you know. I can tell you one thing, you wouldn't want to be going any place the next day. Like. <laughs> but that was Corcoran's chemist. Like, they were there. I remember Brendan Corcoran is not too long dead, but I remember his father before him. And again, they lived up over the shop. As you said, a lot of people did do that back yeah. then. Yeah. Then you had the Ulster Bank. And then you had Matt Farris. Matt Farris would have been. Matt Farris was, again, hardware, drip, hardware grocery and bar, which a lot of them were like. And there were agents for Watney's Red Bar. Watney's Red Bar was a beer. And they were the Midland the agents for the Midlands for it. They employed a lot of people. Watney's Red Beer. Beer Watney's, yeah. I can remember them being there, Peter Malone working in it and uh, they kept a lot they built a piggery out the back. And Albert Gibbons, I think, and Michal McCraner, who died there, I think he worked in it as well. And they'd have all their yard men there and that. That was another big concern. The soul that and Duns opened up in it in the early 70s. It may lie in idle for a couple of days yeah. or a couple of years. Spirit, that's where Spirit, Spirit is today. No, yeah, 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 I remember that as Matt Farris. And next door to that then, see, a lot of shops yeah. were bus stops. Next door... Next door to that then was Berrigan's. And Berrigan's was a grocery and pub. Grocery and pub was Berrigan's. Nicholas Berrigan. It would be related to the shovelings up on the up on the back of the land. Next door to that was the Andy Hotel, and as I told you, I remember the Andy Hotel like and us going by and eat the the doorman had shove us on, we'd be looking to see what was going on, like and him all dressed like and you know, dressed up in his suit, like with all the gold beret and the cap and that. Next then you had the bank that's still there today. Then you had a solicitor where Supermax is. But I, I think there's still a shop there, but you had a solicitor's office and you had the Midland Warehouse. The Midland Warehouse was owned by the Donlands that lived on the, the battery. I went to school with two of them, I don't know where they ever went. But it would have closed and then, it would have closed and in the, well the Downlands would have even in the early 70s. And the Quinns that owned the Quinworths took it over as a supermarket. But it was the Midland Warehouse in my time. That's one side of the game. Mm -hmm. And between Supermax and Harley's, that's where Donald's was. And you went down the gateway a little bit, it was leading on to the bankers, where the car park and where Tesco is today and that. Leading on, there was a pub. It was part of the American Cafe, and there was a pub down that gateway. And at the front of it, there was a restaurant that sold, well I remember they sold chips anyway, and they sold you could go in and have teas and buns and that. And upstairs there used to be wedding receptions. Believe it or not, they have done wedding receptions. Like civil ceremony kind of thing, is it? No, you know, it was just wedding come back and, yeah, yeah. yeah, they held up the stairs up over the, up over the, 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 the American cafe. Mm. It was wedding reception held up in the function room up the stairs. Harleys would have been in the den. Now Harleys would have been there previous to that as a jeweller's. But Harleys bought it and they turned it into a coffee shop ice cream parlour. And then they had the, the chemist next door to it. 
and you went up then just give me a appearance for a minute yeah next door to that then again was Joe Ellis's chemist and then you come to where Edward Valentine is today mm. Kiernan's were there and Kiernan's had a bar on grocery and were big previous to this but another where they were big bakers and they'd have vans going round to deliver the bread throughout the throughout the county the right. county and that. Now these vans were motorised vans, they were pulled by our, by ponies and that. Because I know Billy Tay from St. Michael's Road or the Water Street originally, because I worked in the furniture factory with him, he was an oldest, lot older man than me of course. But he told me he worked in Cairns to let deliver the bread and that and yeah, I do know because we would have been around the back of it, it was derelict. And it, they sold up then, I'd say, in the late 60s, and a man by the name of Ned McGoey bought. And Ned McGoey sold it then to Edward Valentine, it's Valentine's today. And part of that then, when Edward Valentine bought it, there was a shop beside it. It was Bob Killeen's shoe shop. But before it was Bob Killeen's, it was a woman, I can remember being in it with my mother and that, she was a Miss Burke. She had a woman's drapery shop in it and selling curtains and tablecloths and that, like for Miss Burke. Or Burke's one of the Miss Burke. Next door to that, then, again, you had Jimmy Newman's. That's where we dealt, apparently, Jimmy Newman's. And uh, he was grocery bar and bottler. Like, and sold, sold uh, chicken mash, like, and pig meal and that. Like, again, Pasky Devine working as the yard man and that. And he bottled the stout and he measured out the tea and the sugar and whatever it came in there. And the flour and that, when, they, when it came in the tea chest and the flour came in the ten stone bags and that. So <coughs> that was Newman's. You went on then to the bank. And then you went on where the two euro shop is now. Mm. I remember it as Vera Brady's. Vera Brady had two shops. We'll talk about the other one after. But Vera Brady was a woman from Cav and she was a big businesswoman and I think she owned it several shops up in Cavan and up in the northern region but she had the shop there where the two euro shop is and it was called the wedding shop because there'd be mannequins in the window dressing wedding gowns and that like and it was called the wedding shop mm. and uh, she was there I remember I think Christy Warren's wife Lord Rester Maureen Oroho she worked in it I think and Norlin Stateland and a good few more like that and I remember that, and then I remember next door to that was Dorkin's Jewelries. Jewelers, mm -hmm. not long gone. Cullen's was there then. Mm -hmm. Cullen's as it is today. Mick Gaffney was where the video place is now was closed. Mick Gaffney's was there again. It was a pub and a grocer and whatever, like selling that sort of stuff. A lot of the bit of light hardware. Mm -hmm. And next door was Masterson's. I went to school with these two lads that come home from America to live with their grandfather. I think they were children, sons of Waddy Masterson's. I don't know, but they lived out their own kilo. But Masterson's, Mr. Masterson, like he sold Delph and he sold wallpaper. And I remember we'd be in, he used to sell marbles, like we'd be buying marbles and that. But he sold Delph and wallpaper and uh, that sort of stuff and saucepans and kettles and all that sort of stuff. He sold up then, I think, I don't know what it must stay off or that, but I remember them. See, all the shopkeepers at that time wore three-piece suits, like waistcoats, mm -hmm. and they all had, believe it or not, and I can't, I can't remember one that hadn't, they all had pocket watches, like, you know? Mm -hmm. And when they take their jacket off, like, they'd have these things up around their sleeves to hold their sleeves up like their sleeves. You know, they were dressed and turned out immaculate, the mm. shopkeepers were. That was Masterson's. And next door to Masterson's, going down onto St. Square, Square, as we yeah. call it, was McNulty's. Now, the McNulty's lived on the factory. And it was a draper shop, a small draper shop. And Paddy McNulty was a big businessman in Lamford. And I think one of his sons ended up being a newsreader with RTE. Now, where on the battery they lived, I don't know, but they lived on the battery. He would have been involved in the middle of the Western Building Society, involved in a lot of things, Paddy McNulty. Next door to them, then, 
Next door to them then was Sam Denniston's. Denniston's, like as it is today. Uh, as they still are, yeah. Yeah, but Sam Denniston and Eddie. And they, they were in the bicycle business and the electrical business. And they sold the records. When records came out, they, they'd have records out. And they'd play music to attract the people to the shop. Mm. Like. They still kind of do a bit still do something yeah, yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. But that was Denniston's. And the Denniston's are still there. Still there and Ronnie yeah. and his sister. The son Eddie has the bike shop. Yeah, for, but uh, I can remember his grandfather. like, And Ronnie would be about well, he'd be a couple of years older than me. And those two girls, they're still all there. Yeah, they sell music upstairs, like equipment. Yeah. yeah. They sold guitars at that time. Still they they, they were the same 50, 60 years ago, nearly as they are today. Dennis yeah. was the same. And next door to that was Fitzmorris's. And Fitzmorris's was a bit of a grocery shop and sold cigarettes and again sold wallpaper and pots and pans and that sort of stuff. Like that's Michael Fitzmorris now. Michael is still alive and his two sisters, one of them is a Mrs. Farrell on the Van and Lee Road and the other girl, I think she works at Connellan's office there, she's uh, married out in Arda to Quan. That was at Morris's, like that was a sort of, mm -hmm. I think he had a job as a commercial traveller himself but I can't remember, but that was at Morris's, like they were there. Then you went to go down Chapel Street, blah, blah, blah. But neck over then was Centenary Square, over where that pub rise or raise is now yeah. was Mallon's. Mallon's was a public house and it seemed to sell very little but tourists used to go into it and I'll tell you why they went in like. The reason they went in was because their ancestors bought their tickets for America. The people that went from Longford on the Titanic got their tickets in Mallon's. Well. You know, I know what I'm speaking Yeah, about. yeah, Rise Bar. Yeah. Rise Bar or whatever, Mickey Lynch had it or whatever. Before. So when Mallon's had it, it was a bar as well. but there was It was a bar, bar as well, but there were agents for White Star Line. Uh -huh. And you got your ticket for the Titanic or whatever in there. That's where you started your journey. Well, and when the people, well, I mean, they were selling them for beforehand. There were several people went that. You know what I mean, successfully got to the far side and the, the, the tourists used to come and take photographs and go inside. It never moved on with the times. I remember we'd look in, there were two oldish women. We'd look in and it reminded of a bar in the 1880s like well, in that. I'm trying to think, do I ever see a picture of a boat? Of yeah, yeah, something? right, yeah, you've seen this yeah. trip, yeah. The American tricolor on the Titanic yeah. on it, yeah. <coughs> they were shipping agents for the White Star Line and the people, there was a few people from, well there was some survived and some drowned but they were only getting their tickets and people before them and people after got mm -hmm. their tickets in Mallard's. They were like a travel agency, not like just a travel agency, for different, yeah, yeah. yeah. that okay. was Mallard's. Well. And you went up Dublin Street a bit then and Barney Gill had the Eagle Bar and he had, again, he had the grocery and bar. Mm. There, was a lot of, there wasn't too many businesses on Dublin Street, like it was a more a residential street, a lot of people lived on it, like. Well. But you went up and you went, and it was Duffy's lived in it, and McDonald's and one thing and another, and you went up to John Smith's where Milo's is today. That was John Smith's pub. And in the early, early 70s, I think John Smith died, went to Dublin and died. And one of his sons, Bob, one of his sons decided that he'd renovate it. And he done up the bar and he built a big cabaret place at the back, which would have been a big thing in Dublin at the time. There is a big space there. And he the called snooker. it, where the snooker tables yeah, are inside yeah. now, he called it the Nashville Rooms. Ah. And in the early 70s and up to the, it was up to the mid 70s to early 80s, like it would, between the bar and the Nashville rooms, because he always had good artists playing it. There could be four or five hundred people on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night, between that bar that is there now, and, big space. and the, the Nashville rooms, as it was called at the back. I think I heard that yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, if you went up the street again then, and, well, Nicholas Corky and the wife are still there, Kay Carrickey, she'd be an aunt now of that Michal Carrickey that was elected to the Senate there. She's married to Nita's Cork because she had a hairdresser there. Had it up until maybe 20 years ago. Now. Mm -hmm. She had it downstairs originally and then she moved upstairs, I think. And around next door to that then was Holmes's. And Holmes's was a mixed drapery shop again. 
what would be there now, dolls or that, some of them places like, but the homes is were there. Like again, like the other draper shop, like how are they making so much business like that? Don't know, but most of them would have been, a lot of the drapers would have had a land on that like too, yeah. you know, another interest like, okay. right? So you would up then and you had Midland Photography or Midland Photographs, which was Lachlan's. And Lachlan's like would have been, Lachlan's would have been one of the biggest photographers in the Midlands. Mm. At a time, like they had done ninety percent of the weddings and that, and had a place out the back for developing their stuff and they're that. They're all there in their their own photographers and all, like the Lachlans. All the Lachlans are dead now. Mm. So Frank Dolan actually was married to one of them. I don't know if you know Frank Dolan. Came to Longford as a tiler, and uh, he was married to one of the Lachlans. And I think all the Lachlans are dead, but the Lachlans are there and. You went up and there was a few houses, Queen's the Guards was there and McCafferty's was there, uh, them houses. You went up then Matty Clark's pub, where Peter Clark's pub is today. Yeah, yeah. That was his father's and uh, the, the, the Clark's were great athletes and that, but we'll get back to them later on mm. because of other premises. And Donlin's at the chapel. Donald's where Michael or Pat Mallon is today. Mm. That was Donald's at the chapel again. I couldn't like they would have like with the, with the church and the people that was going to the church and that like that would have been a very very busy shop. Mm. We said like fifty years ago in Danford, like so all papers and tobacco and sweets and oranges and whatever like you know general. That was Tommy Donald. Son Leo is still to be had and. His daughter actually is married to Pat Barden, famous Longford footballer in the 60s. They're still to be had. Maybe there's more than someplace else. Dublin or that. But uh, over the road we'll go a day in Huey Dyle's pub as it is today, like pub and grocery as it is. And you come down Dublin Street, Victoria, like if I asked you, you probably know where Victoria Colleges are. You do know, don't you? No. See, Dublin Street is not Dublin Street. If you go up, there's two streets in Dublin Street. If you go up Dublin Street for a walk, yeah. and if you stand in the Clark's pub and you look over, you'll see a plaque. Victoria Cottages is written on it. So Victoria Cottages is part of Dublin Street. And it went from Huey Dyes to the Yards Barracks, like. Bit of a, yeah. yeah, well, it's still to be had. You'd see the sign any day or yeah. past. Victoria Cottages. And uh, there, was, there were private houses till you come down then, we'd say, to the Yards Barracks, like. And when you went by the guards barracks then you had Braden's. Mm. You had Braden's private house and you had Braden's shop. The bake, like there were big bakers to Braden's. They had the bakery at the back. With maybe nine or ten or twelve people working in the bakery. A couple of van drivers. But they had a shop at the front. And they'd have the wedding cakes and the Christmas cakes and the buns and the cakes and the bread and that in there. Julie York worked in it and Anne. And Twaddle worked in too, she might have really met there, but they worked in the front of the shop and the bakery was out the back. And you came down further then, you came down further then with Carneys, Mickey Carney and Brendan Carney today and all that, it was a big family of the Carneys. They had a restaurant on that, like a tea rooms and that, the Carneys. They were here there. And Hagerty's were here next door. Uh, she says, I can't think of her name now, she killed me. But uh, she's married to Jimmy Riley and she lives in Teffia Park. I think of her name in the middle, I just can't think of it now. No, just anyway, it's really. <laughs> but they lived there and then you had Donlan's the barbers. John Donlan, he's still alive. He lives out on the Valley Road. He was a barber there in, right to his sister Mick Dillard's and Josie Dillard's. Uh, he they had a barber shop there. And did they do like the shave and do Oh yeah, he done shave and everything like that. Like what yeah. kind of money we have for a standard kind of But sure, I'd say at that time that uh, like well we wouldn't be getting shaved, but like yeah. I'd say that you get a shave and a haircut like for something in the region of three shillings or that like. In you know, old old money yeah. like you know. Yeah. Eileen. Eileen Hager he married to yeah. Jimmy Riley. Better get in because it's <laughs> put me on the street. But John Donlan was there. Then you come down a bit and the magnet, it was a shop. Mr. Fardell owned it, he was a very high up, he held a very high up position in the, 
in the PNT, let's call it. Like, he was over telephone, telephones and that. Jimmy Fard, he was an engineer in the telephone exchange at the back of the, the post office. They had the magnet. Again, it the sword milk and the sword, whatever, like bit of grocery and, and uh, confectionery and that sort of stuff. That was them. They were there. You come down a bit further. Uh, Jimmy Bennett had a barber shop as well in a room of Williams's house. He had a front room and he had a barber shop. Jimmy Bennett. I don't really know all them Bennett lads. Oh, one of them so has the one of them has the tailors, let's say, or the menders up there. As you go down New Street on your left hand side if you go if you're on Ballyban Street and you're going yeah, down yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well he'd be one of them Bennett's but ah, okay. Jimmy Bennett was a barber there and you went down another little bit and there was Mrs Fitness oh no sorry there was Goodwins he was a watchmaker I can remember him watchmaker Goodwins yeah. and you went down and there was Fitnesses there was Fitnesses had a little, a little supermarket like, but they had it of a supermarket too and next door to that, then, next door to fitnesses, I think, you had a woman by the name of Mrs. Heaney. Again, it's sort of a confectionery and clothes shop and that, or a confectionery and cigarettes and that. Then you had Willie Ward and the wife. He worked in the press office. They lived there. Then you had Braden's Lane. And you had Mrs. McDermott. She used to sell penny toffees and fizz bags and tea and sugar and that where the clothes shop is now, this side of Paddy of Fine Sports. You had Mortis Butchers. You went from Mortis Butchers down where I see you had Corliss's again in other drapers, believe it or not. Corliss's was there. Uh, you had John Frank Riley's wife. John Frank was there as a travel agent or a Jordan's agent and his wife was a hairdresser. Then you had Donlands. Donlands had some of Donlands shop was on Dublin Street and some of it was on Street. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. they had Donlands. They had a restaurant by the name. Well, firstly they had a pub. Jackie Nolan was the barman in the pub. Then they had Donlands Dandy Diner. It was an American Dandy style Dandy. restaurant. A lot of yeah, stuff. it was an American style. I remember Helen Flaherty out of Teffy Park worked in and Josephine Gray, I think out of uh, Chapel Street, I can't remember who else. But I remember you could go in, this, there were swiveling, so you could sit back, but there were swiveling chairs on, and yeah, uh, yeah. you'd get, uh, you'd get like chip, chips and sausages and maybe a glass of my waddy orange or something for one and sixpence or two shillings, like, it was a big thing to do. Yeah. That would have opened, I suppose, in the early 60s. That was the they the cars as well, like, they did the cars. No? Yeah, well, these were, they were sort of different dogs. Yeah, okay, yeah. They had actually petrol pumps outside it as mm. well. And uh, then they had, they had, as it is today, a confectionery shop and mm. paper shop and whatever is there today. But upstairs they had a sports shop. They sold all the sports gear of the day. Like football, stockings, football, yeah, like boots, shirts, uh, hurling sticks. Well, yeah, all that, like yeah. golf clubs, rugby balls, anything in the day would have been a very up to speed mm. sports shop up the stairs. Lal and John. John ran one bit of it, Lal ran the other. Like, they ended up turning the whole of it into a pub, like, eventually. Mm. Well, I mean, where the Donald's Dandy Diner was, like, ended up being a pub. They extended the pub and got rid of the restaurant. Oh, okay. Several would have had it down through the years. And uh, we're going up. New Street now. No, we're going up Ballyman Street. Right, up Ballyman Street. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We're going up Ballyman Street. You had uh, Ned Gaffney's. Used to sell vegetables and sweets and minerals and all that yeah. sort of stuff. He was married to, uh, he was married to his sister, Mel Deans. Mel Dean was a famous athlete around Lamford. Like he was, again, he was what would be one of the ones that would have been capped for. Ireland as a junior international. I think he played rugby for them too. Oh. And uh, he was a solicitor. His practice was up the stairs and the little shop was downstairs. Next door then you had the Marion shop. The Marion shop was a sort of a gift shop. It sold like souvenirs and religious stuff like beads and holy water fans and statues and all that sort of stuff. There was two women in it but the man that owned it was a tradesman. 
he used to do building work on that around the town. I can't remember their names. <laughs> Next door to that then, well you had Josie Vaughan's. Well you had Vaughan's. Now Josie Vaughan, Josie Gillard came to work in Vaughan's and she bought the shop. And she later on married Jack McKenna. So it was Vaughan's, Gillard's or McKenna's. But it was a paper shop and uh, it was a paper shop and sold toys and sold chocolate and the usual, which was an odd name. Next door to that, then, you had pageants betting shop. There was 23 bookies in that, there was two pageants and there was Keenan's. This is going back for as far as I can remember. And you had pageants betting shop. Then next door to that, you had Harney's Chemist again. And next door to that, where that chip shop is now, the McCam, what do you call it now? Gelly Burger McCarry. Yeah. McCarry. That was Owen Shortlands. Again, it was grocery, pub and light hardware. Owen Shortlands. Brendan Farrell came home from America. He was from Valley, I think. He came home from America, I'd say, in the late 60s or early 70s. And he turned it into a supermarket and off license. Next door to that, then, you had the Miss Donlands. They were sisters of Tommy Donlands at the cathedral that we spoke about. They had a sort of a confectionery bakery shop in it. I remember like you, you could go up and get a sandwich cake and then a sponge cake. And up the stairs they had a little tea room. They were the Miss Donlands. That's where McGill is now. They're to mm. McGill's and that. That's where that is there today. Well next door then to that was, next door then to that as far as I can remember, was Mickey Kane's pub. That's Cain's now that have the buses on that. Yeah. That was Mickey Cain's pub. I don't know who it was before that. But in my time it was Mickey Cain's pub. Next door then again, you had Vera Brady's second shop, which would have been for smaller items and the general shop, like. The bigger shop was on the town, as we said. Then you had Bill Madden's pub, where young Andy Burden is today. Mm. Next door to that then, as it is now, you had O'Brien's, Butchers. Old Ma O'Brien was there, like. The lad that's in it now, I seen his grandfather in it, like. I seen his father, young Matt as we call him, and this lad now that's in it now. Like so there was three generations of O'Brien's I seen in that shop. I think Matt O'Brien was a Galway man, but that's irrelevant. But I can remember him. And <coughs> then after O'Brien's you had War Chew Shop. You had a shoe wars and a big shoe shop like this old. You know, it would have been a very big shoe shop and it stayed, you know what I mean. Mm. I remember they'd have the stuff outside in the street displayed like in that, you know. They'd leave now they'd only leave out one the way. One left and a right shoe like Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they were there. Then you had Jack Shandley. Jack Shandley had a green grocer, believe it or and a pub. And that's where what would mix. What would be there today now? I think it's around where that DVA is. I'd want to be up the street looking, but you had Jack Shandley's. And uh, Jack Shandley's would have been a very upmarket pub in Longford at the time, like the golfer's pub. But uh, upmarket for Jack Shandley, I remember well. Next door to that, then I think you would have McNamara's butcher shop. Liam Rosmond, Paddy McNamara had two butcher shops, I think, in the town, and he was killed. And Lyons has bought one of them, and Liam Rosmond came to it as a butcher and he ended up buying it after him, as far as I know. You had that. Then you had the, uh, well, let's see, give me a minute, I've got my burns. I think next to that then was John Gregg's pub. The Prefany Bar, I think, was the name of John Gregg's pub. That's where the vacant site is there today. Mm. And you had Jones's super, Jones's Again, the grocers and that. And Freddie Woods came, and it would have been Mace then, like at that time. But Mace. it was Jones as previous to that. Then Freddie Woods came, who would be right to Davis of today and that. Like the Woodses and the Davises and the Joneses would be the other one. But Freddie Woods, I think, bought off Joneses and whatever way they were married in or whatever. But it's Davises, as I said, today. It's just. Super value, mm. but they were starting off in there. This is where Hetridge is now. No, Hetridge was. Yeah. We have to come to Hetridge yet. Yeah. Hetridge was always there for as long as I can remember. I don't know yeah. who was there beforehand. 
and after Hetridge's then Hetridge's would have been the first pork butchers in Hanford, like mm. you know. So the, they were a consortium, they had butcher they had butcher shops throughout the, the country like Hetridge's had and Louis Hetridge came there, I don't know when he came there, I can't remember when he wasn't there. Mm. And next door to that then you had Charlie Riley, a barber. Then next door to that then you had Emmanuel Strange. It was a very small little shop, but they done everything. There were tailors, the fixed bicycles, the fixed radios. Old Mrs. Strange used to buy and sell comics. They were there, Stranges. Had to be all dead and gone now. Mm. All the, that Strange that, that lives near, an old Strange, is he old, that lives on the park road opposite the dog track. He'd be one of them, or his father would be one of them Strangers to regret musicians. And you were ducked into the corner, and there was a man by the name of Paddy McNamara. You know what that is now? I think he was like, no, he was. I think it was him in a minute. He was a vet, and he had his, he had his, Ned McNamara, he was a vet, and he had his house and office there or whatever. And you went down, we're going down New Street now. Don't do the other side of. Well, we were on Bolivar oh, Street yeah. going oh, yeah. down yeah, yeah. New Street. Yeah. Well, there was not only private houses on New Street, really, only the Temperance Hall. Yeah. And over the far, well, Jim Quinn, the dentist, was there. Mm. And uh, do you remember much happening in the Temperance? Oh, I do. The bingo was yeah, and... when I remember that, we used to go to the hops on it on the Saturday night. Yeah. I was ever getting from I was about twelve or thirteen, and there'd be a hop. It was called or a disco go go on the Saturday night. A half crown to get in. A disco go go. Yeah, that's what it was called. <laughs> and believe it or not, uh, the fellow that provided the music was a fellow by the name of Christy May. And Christy May, as far as I know, would be a very successful businessman today. He owns the Bridge Hotel and the Bridge Centre in Tullamore. And he was the DJ. And I'll tell you who played in it now. Uh, Phil Leonard played in it. I think. Tin, Tin Lizzie. Yeah, well. Tig Lizzie, yeah, yeah, that was dark hair, yeah, the yeah. moustache and yeah, guitar. Yeah, he played in it. Well. And some others played it, but uh, Christy May would be there, the disco ball, it started around, yeah. well it started at nine, but it had to be finished before twelve. Yeah. Because the, the Catholic Church around the country, and it couldn't go on until Sunday, because you had to be sort of home early for Mass. So it finished, we'd say, at five or ten to twelve. But we would, that would have been our first out in the cigars going to the disco, well. like. Big thing to go. If you're getting ready for dinner. I know the Grafford RSM used to have a used to be over there to poo, the snooker. Yeah, well, again, it was, was, was later on maybe. Well, it, well, there were several sections in it. There was snooker yeah. in it as well. Yeah. But the, the disco go go <coughs> would have been held in the main hall, and there was boxing tournaments held in it, and there was bingo held in it, and there would be uh, table tennis tournaments in it, and that like in the Temperance Hall. Yeah. So a lot of activity happening. Yeah, yeah in the Temperance yeah. Hall and. Uh, do you ever go to bingo with any aunties or any aunties? My mother used to go on that. Yeah. Do you ever go up Yeah, when we were children. Like Smoky Hall and all yeah, that. Yeah, when we were yeah. children we'd be brought. Yeah, yeah. Particularly if it was a big pot, like. Yeah. You'd be brought because if there was two bit of an extra chance of winning it. <laughs> mother was lucky at it, actually. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, as he said, like, that was New Street to an extent. And McGarry's events was there and Jim Quinn. And on the far side, Doc, Dentist Carraway was there, I think, and Dr. Fitzpatrick. And there was a woman by the name of Dr. Ped York. We used to be brought, it's the yellow door there now today. We'd be brought if we had to be but as children do it like. And sure, like she charged the people as regards to who to wear or that. Like, I mean, mm. I'd say she was only doing it for nothing or very little, like she didn't make a fortune of it. She charged everybody different, like half a crown or whatever, if you had that mm. sort of thing. She was an old lady. She lived to be a great age. And she was on that street and Dermot Hagerty that played in the planes when he was reared in that street and several others I can't remember. And you went up then to Jimmy Degnan's pub, where John Degnan's is now. That was there. <clears throat> and when you turned into when you turned into Earl Street, there was Howard's restaurant was there. Now, Tommy Donahoe married this Howard woman. Some call it Howard's restaurant, the more call it Donahoe's. It's on the corner there at Cassins. Mm, right, yeah, Cassins, yeah. But I don't know 
as much as the restaurant, they used to do a lot of B&B for lorry drivers and that. Oh, okay. And if they were coming back the next night or that, they went in and they had an evening meal. I can't know was it open to the general public, but it was mm. Howard's restaurant. And it was B&B and evening meal or whatever for the people that were staying the night. Mostly truckers again. Yeah. And next door to that, Jack, Jack Conroy had a television shop and radio shop. That would be still all part of Castles. Do you know what I mean? Because mm. the shops were small. Like if you look at, you call it Castles there, but there was Howard's and there was Jack Conroy's television shop and radio shop. And you went up, there was a private house and then there was the Lissadell pub. Owned by a man by the name of Ned Corcoran. <laughs> Is that where the Earl Inn would have been? That's where the Earl Inn would have been, yeah, whatever. That was the list I'll take two ways now. Ned later. Corcoran owned it and he had his son, young Ned, sir. And we used to play a hurling with him in the fair green. I think you know, we used to be in the town, I think he went to school in Lanesboro, but he was drowned, he was an only child, I think, and he was drowned at young as in an accident at the Shannon. Ned Corcoran owned it that, firstly. And then I remember uh, Jack Conroy sold the TV shop and bought that pub. And Tommy Riley then, that we spoke about earlier on, the work in the creamy, he bought it. And several zones, and I don't know, but that's where Take Two is now. Mm. And then you went up a little bit further, there was a house or two, there was Cox's house, and there was whatever. <coughs> and where John Quinn is now today was Mathis's sub post office. It was a sub post office, plus he sold newspapers and bits of groceries and bits of chaplain, mm -hmm. and he sold fishing rods and fishing gear. Yeah, okay. But if he did, they had, they had a big yard at the back, and they used to have cattle and that down on the, the, back, down on the canal, let's say. They had land down mm -hmm. on the canal where Farney Hogan houses are built today. Mm -hmm. That was Mattis's, but it was a sub post office it was called. Right? Yeah. And next door to that then was Fanning's. And Fanning's was again a grocer and hardware, or sorry, pub and grocery. And they sold that to two women. Two women came from Cavan and they named it the town and country. Mm. And the reason they named it the town and country because one of these women was from the town of Cavan and the other was from the country. Do you understand? Yeah, right. so so that's where I came from. Town and country. And Eamon Farrell bought that then about 1974. And as it is today, like it was Eamon Farrell's. And he went up then, up as far as Paddy McEwan's to his private houses. Hmm. Uh, well, Corliss is that had the shop in Dublin Street, they lived there. And Lucius Farrell that had the leader works, they lived there. And, and Mr. Stewart that was very much over the ESB. He lived there, and Duffy's the vets. Mrs. Duffy's still alive today. She still lives there. And you went up into Paddy McEwan's pub, mm. like as it is today. But the printers wasn't there back then, was it? Robert? Which printers? Do you know... Um, Turner's. Yeah. Oh, well, Turner's would have been there in the house, but the printers would have been on... Back. The printers would have been on the convent road or something. Ah, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like, let's say. Uh, yeah, of course, Turner's is always there, so they're there for generations. Mm. And we're going up by McEwan's pub now when we're going for the railway. And I'll tell you why we're going for the railway. Because, like, the railway would have been an unbelievably busy place in the 60s. Mm. First, yeah. they had the garage. Like, Stuff coming and going. Right, and first, they had a garage with a lot of people working in it, like the railway garage. Then you had the station as it was, there'd be an awful lot of buses coming and an awful lot of the trains coming and the buses. And next door to it then, I'd say the railway would have owned it, but you had Slowey's restaurant. The building is still there to this day, yeah. standing up. I always knew that in my child years, or younger years, of Slowey's restaurant. And the Miss Slowey's ran it, and like that would be... Jim Cork, Jim Keller's mother, I'd say now, and possibly one of the Crossan's mother, but there were Slowys and the ran it. We know it as Slowys restaurant. And was it a bed and board as well? No, it was only a restaurant. Just, just well, it, a restaurant. Been, it was a big restaurant. It would have been a very busy place. It would have stayed open up until the 70s, I'd say. Because don't forget, not at all the people coming off buses and trains. You had the people that was working in the, in the garage, and plus you had the goods yard. 
Now, the good it's yard so far for John McEwen has the flats today, like. Yeah. You know, the big yellow the road from Yeah, there. that was the good yard. And, like, I mean, there would be unbelievable activity there, like, mm. because a lot of stuff came by train, like, for the mm. local shops and that. You, as you said, it would have been horse and cattle. That had to be brought with the drain, yeah, that, yeah, like, yeah. down around the town and that. So, Slowey's restaurant would have been a very, very busy place. Mm. I remember a woman worked in it by the name of Miss Terrell, Mrs. Terrell, Miss Terrell from St. Michael's Road. Her daughter was married to Dermy Gray. She actually, she worked, she worked in Vera Brady's and she died young. But Miss Terrell worked in it and the Slowies themselves and whoever more I can't remember. So that's that anyway and we've done the station and now I suppose we go down to the Fair Green but we'll talk about the Fair Green after if you want to. But we'll keep going down Errol Street. Yeah. And there were mostly private houses that was on Errol Street at the time. You had Maloney's. Jerry Maloney was a big cattle jobber and cattle dealer and his son is to this day. And they had a yard in that. And you had Chapman's lived there and Victory's had a big yard. And Victory, you know the flats there, you ever see the sign Victory's? Mm -hmm. You know where the black gates are? Yeah. That was Victory's and Felix Nevin would have buy that and building flats there in, in the year, late 60s or early 70s. And as I said, you had the Chapman's lived there and you had Paddy Clavy and Paddy Clavy and the sister lived there, Mr. Mr. Sucker, as he was always known. He was a printer in the leaderboard. This guy who did have the the, the, the matches for him, the yeah, corner, Paddy Clavy. Yeah, Paddy Clavy Cup. And up in Legion Terrace, there's Clavy hmm. Park or Clavy Terrace. That's called after Paddy Clavy because I think they originally came from, I think his father might have been a soldier, and they might have come from Legion Terrace to wherever, but the Clavy, so anyway. A day lived there, and then you turned down into the square. Mm. And the first place on the square was Noel McGeaney's father had a petrol station there, right? And a little, small little bit of a garage. And Barney Kane bought it off of him in about 1967. Remember that pump was still there, or what it was? Yeah, the pumps are still there. Yeah. And uh, when Barney Kane bought it in 1967, I think it was 60, 66, definitely 67. I went working for him as a petrol pump attendant. And uh, he used to open at the 8 o'clock or maybe half 7 in the morning, which is a big thing, and stay open till maybe 11 at night or that. Or this was a new thing you were saying? This was a new thing and yeah. a big thing. And uh, I was there selling the petrol and serving the petrol for him, and Pat York was there as a sort of. He used to do brake pads and change oil and fix punctures and that. Like. He used to be a taxi man with a Pat York. Pat York in later life would have been a taxi man, yeah. His mother worked in prayers. And uh, we were, I was there with him then for a while. And Dan's printers would have been next door. Jackie Dan, Dan's printers work. Dan's had a printing works there from, uh, from the turn of the century, his father before him, or maybe his grandfather. And you went down there then, and there was a couple of private houses and uh, you went down, we say, as far as Gills. The big house is still there today now. There's a car park there and that. There's a garage. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was Gills' house. Brendan Gills' father. And he was a coal merchant. And then he bought the Father McGivney Hall, which was next door. And I think it was the Father McGivney Hall, he called it. And he got into second hand furniture. That was the that's where the garage is. Yeah, that's yeah. where the garage and that had been today, and the yeah. buildings are still there. So, Gills had a coal yard or the turf yard, as they were called at that time, and they had the furniture store next door. And the father we gave the hall, I think, was the name of it. And you went down then, and in the 60s, then, in the late, mid 60s or 66 or 67, the swimming pool was built. But prior to that, Mick Neary, the Neary's lived down the square. I can barely remember the harbour, mm. like the water in the harbour. But I do know one thing, like that when Cathy was three or four, no Nagini pulled her out of the harbour. Like she pulled several out children that fell in. Mm. So obviously, when sure when Cathy was three or four, that had to be in about nineteen sixty two or three. So there was obviously water in it at that time. Mm. So I can barely remember. I remember yeah. Dermot boats in it and the black railings around the harbour. Yeah. But the Nearys lived there too, and the Nearys kept an awful lot of chickens. McNeary, I think, was an agricultural instructor of that, and he kept a lot of chickens. 
in billets that he had built and he moved from the chickens then on to a piggery that he had there. And you come over then, you're coming off the square then we'll say, known McGinney's house as it is today, that's where the McGinney's lived. And uh, Noel had a garage where the tire place was. Hmm. Noel had the garage there, the Brattons worked with him and he, after a while, the garage, he got into the plumbing business. He was a plumber. And next door to that was McCormack's, the wool merchants. And you went on, McCormack's were big employers, a lot of lorries and big around, there were wool, grain merchants, all that. They owned it, well, they didn't own it, but they ran the market house as well, where deals and that is today. So you had no McGinnies, the garage, the wool stores as we call them. They give a lot of employment. I like Toad and Charlie. Woolworths. Yeah. Hmm? Woolworths, is it? Wool. Yeah. Wool. Yeah. I, I remember, no, on that, just beside the left of the market square, it used to be Wool. I think it was Woolworths, was it? This little shopping centre, was it? Or, I remember Santi being there in here or something. Yeah, but we've got, we get ahead yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, getting ahead of you there now. Yeah, right. <laughs> you had wool stores. Then you went up Camels. Mm. These were the people that lived there on Bridges Terrace. Mickey Cam Mick Camel was a big fowl merchant, scrap dealer. Dealt in fowl, dealt in scrap, dealt in everything like that. They were big employers and seasonal employers, the same as happens in the vines, like. Cathy's mm. father worked with them for years, like. And they were going all out through the country every week, buying chickens and eggs and bringing them back in and selling them to the Dublin markets and to the English markets or wherever, like, you know. Mm. That was Camels, and uh, next door to Camels then, next door to Camels then, you had uh, a woman by the name of Biddy Murray or that, she kept, she kept lodger on that, I can remember. And you went up a bit, and Camels then had another place, I think. No, you went up then, up the couple of steps as to where, you went up, the Palace Bar was there, where the Lido or that was later on. It was the Palace Bar. Camels did have another yard. But anyway, the Palace Bar was there, and Mrs. Christie bought as the Lido Cafe, it was called. You would have bought it in the, in the late 60s or that. And it was the Lido. Then you went to McCormick's again. They had more stores, they were into grain, they were into furniture, they were auctioneers, they were everything. Isaac McCormick's. You went further down then and you had the Lamford Leader Works. That's where the original Lamford Leader was, till it was burdened in the, I don't know, it was in the 60s or that, there was a fierce fire in it. But the, the, the redone it and it moved on again, but the Lamford Leader was there. Mm. And you went down then to Healy's pub, where the market bar is. Right? Mm. That was Healy's. You come down, there was a private house, a sister of the Clarks lived in it. She was married to a man by the name of O'Connor, A. Clark. Jimmy O'Connor was his name, he was a driver on the railway. They lived there. And the Miss McHugh's, McHugh's had a little shop, but it never used to open. I don't know what's around, but it was one of the few shops in Lamford that didn't open. Like, but the McHugh's, they lived out in a blind man's walk. There'd be some, there'd be ants or some relation of John Mimius or some Michael Drone. Mm -hmm. But the Miss McHugh's lived out on the blind man's walk. But they had a little shop. But I do remember, and your grandfather I think would have been one of them, they used to let the lads in, there'd be always lads forming vans around Lamford. Now that's as you go up the lane way to go into the back way of buying sports, if you're yeah. on, Right. And there was a little lane way, and she had a little shed there, and I can remember Brendan Carley and Rapper Ryan, as he was called, and maybe your father and Joe Keenan and them, they used to be practicing, mm -hmm. playing guitar, like and singing in there. You're my room. Uncle Oliver now, maybe. Yeah. Maybe so, yeah, yeah your Uncle yeah, Oliver, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the Miss McHugh's lived there. Yeah. Then you come down to Clark's, where Pat Fallon's mm -hmm. is now, like, where it's close. Easy, yeah. And the Clark brothers owned it that. So I told you there were several Clark brothers. They were a big family at the minute. They were fierce athletes. Like they represented Ireland at several things at soccer, rugby, I think, running. Jimmy Clark, I think, mm. held some sort of a sprint record for running. But they were unbelievable athletes. But that was Clark's. And it was a grocer's and pub. 
And as I told you before, I remember we used to come to watch the television then. Mm. And I seen the World Cup in it in 1966. We did, like, you said, let the children in. We could sit up, sit down at the counter, or sit down watching this television, like. And I remember, I remember he'd come round some events, not time, Willie, he'd come round and he'd have a, he'd have a tray of, we'd say, my Waddy Orange or a tray of red bean or whatever it was at the time, and a plate of biscuits, like, for dividing some of like, it was a great treat. Mm -hmm. Next door to that, then, you had uh, Heaton's. Heaton's, like again, Heaton's had stores throughout the country, had stores in that loan. They had one in Granard at one stage too, and they had several. Do you know, they had stores throughout the country, like, you know, mm. clothes again, mm. like all sorts of clothes and houseware and bed linen and all that. The man with the name of Mr. Bedford was the manager in it at the time. I remember that, and I can't, can't remember much of the cars who worked in it. The Rogers man from so well enough they're not working it. Mm -hmm. Taxi O'Connor from Granner, I think, working it too. And that was Heaton's. And then, then I remember you had a barber, you had Fardles of Barbers. And there might have been, a, I think Mickey Carney served his time in it. Mickey Carney was a barber there in Lamford, like one of the Carneys over Dummer Street. That was there. And then the next place I can remember, I can remember Miss McGee's. There was some relation to the Mattises and maybe the relation of Andy Quinn's too. They had two shops. They had what was called a baby shop. One of them had, it was specifically for babies and children, small children's clothes, mm. was one of the shops. That had been now where Hallmark is today. You know, Hallmark is yeah. the cat. That yeah. was the baby shop. And the other shop again was a confectionery, sweets, confectionery, cigarettes. You could go in and sit down and get a tray of. Uh, you could you could you could go in and sit down and get a, a bowl of ice cream in it, like with a bit of raspberry or something on top of it for sixpence or that. Yeah. They were there. Then that's the gateway now going up to Val O'Connor's. The flow, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know that gateway. Yeah. Well if you went up that gateway then you went down into Healy's Terrace, as we call it, or the Blue Yard. And there was a row of old houses in it. There was eight or ten houses in it down my youth. And I can remember there was two entrances into it. It was like a picture postcard sort of thing. All the houses were painted, were whitewashed white. And all the doors would be different in colours. And they had a flower bed that ran the length of in the summertime like it was like we'd seen a picture postcard. They had a flower bed that ran the the length of the the, the terrace like. I remember Oh, Dan Whelan and his son Paddy lived in it, and little Christus lived in it, and Anthony Gill and his mother lived in it. His mother worked in the hospital down in St. Joseph's Hospital. The Gills still live over, one of them works in the supermarket there. Yeah, today, yeah, and Abby, his grandmother Abby. I'm talking about. Yeah. They and old Bobby Devine lived in it, and old Bobby Devine would be a relation to the Devines here on the terrace. And I remember he used to go around at the football matches and at the fairs and that with a basket selling fruit and ice, fruit and bars of chocolate and whatever, like. That was Healy's Terrace, or the Blue Yard, if you want to call it. Next door to that then going down, right, was, next door to that going down then was Jim Eli's pub and grocery again. He lived there, he was a very accomplished rugby player in the 1920s or that with Lamford Rugby, like, at that time. Hmm. And uh, he lived at a, 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 went to school with a couple of sons of his. That was Jim Malloy's pub and grocery and chicken meal or whatever. Next door then again was Frank Murphy's. And Frank Murphy's was again a pub and a grocery and a restaurant up the stairs where you could go and get your, where people would go up and get their dinner and that. That's where the red two euro shop was closed today. I know, yeah. Next door to that then was a shop of Paddy Horrigan's because Joe Dorkins was only half the size it is now, really. As it is now. And they would have buying that and expand it. Then you, you had Joe Dorkins. Well, Con Dorkins was Joe's father. And again, they were drapers of all sorts. Mm. But men, drapers and shoes. And well, it's boots and that, like. Drapers and, and that. Next door, then going down, you had the entrance to Bog Lane, which is the back way up to the Peely's Terrace of the Rulia. Mm. Uh, then you had Pat Farrell. 
Pat Farrell had a pub there and he'd sell uh, he'd sell sugar and tea and snuff. Well, snuff was common enough. We used to go for snuff for a lot of the women from here. The older women now, the grannies, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, like a lot of them snuff. And you'd be sent to Pat, Pat Farrell's own snuff and that. And then you had Sean McDermott with the White House. Mm -hmm. Again, pub and grocery. And Peter Joigos before Jimmy Cain bought it in the early 60s and turned it in. It was a pub. They again didn't seem to do much. But Jimmy Cain bought it and turned it into a pub, an updated pub, and moved his coal yard from Harbour Row. He used to have the coal yard in Harbour Row, moved it up to the back of the pub. So now we're leaving Ballymahan Street, we're going to come down and say yeah. Killashi Street, right? Mm. And on Killashee Street you had the Farrells, mm. as they are, well, it's still there today. Still, well, the Farrells, John Farrell's there, but his uncle and his father ran a bicycle shop and sold electric gear, like, mm. and would fix, fix a radio or fix a kettle at the time or whatever else, an iron if you had one. And next door to that then, you had Frank, for Christy Monaghan is, you had Frank Casey's butcher shop. Frank still Casey, a butcher's, uh, Still a butcher's, he, Frank Casey came from Kiena and he had a butcher shop there. And he retired at Christy Monaghan Bar. And you had the Walls lived there. I think it was a man man and wife or brother and sister. And one of them, the man worked for the nuns, I think, he doing the gardens and the convent and that. And he was Walls. And Christy Warnock's people lived there too. And you came down a little bit. I might be missing one or two, but Mannion's lived there. Mr. Mannion was a soldier. He was in the convo. Seamus Mannion now that cleans the windows today, I don't really know. His father, Jim Mannion, was one of the first to, to go to the Congo because I remember he brought Seamus back uh, a spear and a shield, like, and it was unreal, like, that he could have them and we couldn't, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. And his, his uh, Mrs. Mannion done dinners. It was a sort of a restaurant or that, like, or she had regulars for dinners, like a bit of a restaurant. If I'm not a bit further, Dan Kenny then had the house and the garage. The garage, the pumps are still there. Yeah, the pumps are still there. Yeah. You know, Mrs. Cheevers then had the chips. Yeah, Mrs. Cheevers is still living over there. Mrs. Cheevers used to send chips and sausages and make. We used to go over and sit in the room, a little room, like a big fire. Great treat, like, you know. You came down then, well over there, there used to be boxing go on in there, like. In that, where the pitch of a garage is. Yeah, like. there was boxing there, and Dan had the carrots in the back that's still there. Now that's the most to kill the Street, and yeah. you go up on the other side then, and Thomas Welch, there was a bakery on Kill the Street. Well, it wasn't on Kill the Street, it's on the entry to Anley Park, if you know what mm. I mean. You know where this new building yeah, yeah. is here? Yeah. Well, that was Welch's bakery. Thomas and his sister lived there, Welch's bakery, and Jim Marston worked in it, Barney Howard, and I can't remember. Mel Mulligan later days when he when Britons would have closed them, but there was a lot. But Welch's bread, did you ever hear of Welch's bread? No? I did actually. Yeah, well, that's Welch's bread, that's the bakery there. Where that, when you leave here and look up, you see, that's Welch's. The back of Riley's, basically. Like yeah. That, and just top of this stage. Yeah. yeah, and the next to that, then the Conleys lived there, who would be uncles of Christy Warner's. Uh, the Bianca's and Aunts of Christy Warnock's, Beryl Conley and Jim Conley and Paddy Conley, they lived there and next door to that was Fardles and there was a Miss Riley's, she kept lodgers and uh, you had the, is it the name of the me? you had the cinema then, like. mm. think of the name of it in a minute now. <laughs> of course you had the cinema Wall Street too as well, Malloy's mm. and you had the cinema down you had the cinema. Down across from here. The, yeah, the Adelphi. Yeah. yeah, where Ali is now. Yeah. yeah, and further down this road, I'm just, we just go this further, Jim O'Hara. Uh, Jim O'Hara had a monumental works, like making headstones and writing the, 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 the whatever's on the headstones, and, and then he had and work from That was down there where them little houses are. But we're coming back up now anyway. We'll take a name of the cinema there. We're coming back up again like to John Joe Riley's. Mm. And uh, I don't know, I think that's nearly that's, yeah, that's nearly all the, you have all the streets done now. Right, but that's the streets. <laughs> and we just talk about like what like pick it like a Saturday. Oh sure, Saturday like well, well to me, like Saturday was unreal, like. Yeah. I remember like we go I'd go up the street here they, like firstly, depending on the time of year, like Bernie Chardon over here had sell plants. 
cabbage plants. And the Mac Macavoy man there from over about the cliff or whatever, he sold them as well and in the season, like. Mm. They came in bundles of 100 or 120, like, different varieties of cabbage plants. People brought them out the country, they went out and bought them off them and they came in and sold them to the people in the town. Because an awful lot of people, or to anybody, but an awful lot of people grew their own cabbage and yeah. vegetables. So, on a Saturday, we're well, burning short to be there, well, first you have people selling calves. Like the Shotnesses and the Slammons and the Cassidy's and there would be calves on the square and calves on Ballyman Street on Clark side like and that. Yeah. And he he passed out with one of the piggy pigs. Yeah, well, we'll go to them in a minute. And uh, as I said, they'd be there and there'd be people that come in then, there'd be stall holders that come in like mm. and they'd set up stalls on the street. Some selling clothes like and more selling pots and pans and mm. knives and forks and whatever you want like hardware and tools and that like and toys and there'd be three or four different Fellas come on, we'd be watching for to give them a hand to set up or whatever, like, mm. and you'd give Bernie Shorten a hand if you had time, and you'd be mooching around the town the whole day, and well, you'd be doing around here and there, and in the evening you'd go up again and give them a hand to load up again, and they'd give you whatever it'd be, like two shillings or whatever, and if you were with Bernie Shorten, you see a lot of people would buy plants, and they'd want them left at the bus stops or at the station, and there were several bus stops in the town, like, because mm. McGurr's bus would be coming in and Jackson's bus and I think Billy Natten from Valley Maham would have a bus and the people would be going about their business but they'd want the plants left mm. at the shop that was the mm. bus stop. Yeah. And we'd be commissioned to bring them down to uh, Sean McDermott's was a bus stop like and Berrigan's was a bus stop and Mick Gaffney's and there was others. And they'd be told I'd be bringing down this. The woman would give you maybe a shilling for yourself or whatever we're bringing them down for and be at that all day up and down the town and remember Barney Lennon in the cabs and he might go into the market bar for a drink or in the Brady's as it was and if we were hanging around he'd say if anybody comes looking for me you know where I am you know where I am if you go in and tell him there's somebody looking for me he'd give you a shilling or something yeah. we moved around the town the whole day and as I say it's like there'd be another fellow used to come another man used to come in the season and he'd be selling flowers Okay, like all sorts of plants and shrubbery and flowers like that. Now I mean flowers in pots, like to grow in gardens and that. A lot of people buy it now up in like the like, town. Oh, be, season kind of stuff like Yeah, the town would be a hive of activity at the time yeah. like and as I said, then an odd time like there could be people playing music and around with the cardigans playing music like, and people contributing. They'd go up and down the town playing music mm. like in the fair days or Different not acts. every Saturday but on Saturdays. And then your man would come like as I says, the strong man would come as we call him like and he'd have a, he'd have a little assistant with him and he'd have a spieler like you know a loud hailer. And he'd be saying, come and see the strongest man yeah. on earth, like, and this fella would arise strip down, like, and <laughs> he'd start, like, well, he'd start off, like, by swallowing swords, like, and he'd swallow it down, like, he'd pull up a hip of blades and he'd swallow oh. them down, and then yeah. he'd start spitting fire or dancing on glass. This would be over in Centenary Square, now, yeah. you know, this, and your man then would be assisting them in every way, but the like, I remember the final act, like he put down a bed of nails, something similar to that, like, mm. and he'd lay on it, on this bed of nails. Yeah. And he, he, the assistant come in, he put something on his chest, like we call it a, a, a sheet of timber or that. And he'd get somebody to jump on his chest, like the biggest man in the audience, well. <laughs> jump on it, and you want to get two, maybe two or three jumping dicks, he'd get up like it was a collection made and they were gone. Like. Yeah, yeah, but it was amazing how we could do it. Yeah, like. yeah. Swallow on the sword, like swallow the blades. He'd spit, well, he'd take whatever he'd take and spit out the fire. That's maybe no, something you see every day now around yeah, the he, He'd be sort of dancing, yeah. dancing on glass, like, but he'd lie on the bed of nails. Like, dancing and, on glass? Yeah. Well. I don't know how it was done or how they could. Yeah. Seemed crazy. Seems yeah, unbelievable. Some kind of trick anyway. There's several other people, a yeah. lot of people alive that seen it like. Yeah. I don't know who he was or where he came from. He obviously yeah. must have been a sidekick from a circus, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You know. So we're like fairly busy on a Saturday, like it's yeah. I know he wouldn't come every. No, every Saturday. Saturday no. You might only see him once. twice a year or yeah. whatever. And to be people selling a holiday, special holiday or something. Like yeah, to be people selling clothes on a Saturday on the streets, yeah. like to be people setting up well, second hand clothes, mm. and to be uh, Bible readers were coming out time, like they'd be going up and down the town, like with 
hockey talkies like speaking about Jesus mm. and the Lord and they done this and they done that. Like and again as I told you before, mid nine o'clock, half nine again the shops had closed on the Saturday night. Mm. The shops stayed open very late on a Saturday night because the country people wouldn't come in till after till tea time or that, like it's particularly in the summer like. Because mm. they have their own thing to do, John. They have their own farm and work to do and the, yeah. the, the, the husbands probably drive the wives in and uh, the evening and do their bit of shopping or whatever. As you said, there wasn't a lot of people living in town. Do you know mm. what I mean? There wasn't a lot of people living literally in town. No, but you see, a lot of the shopkeepers, you must remember, an awful lot of shopkeepers lived over lived there. Themselves. There was a lot of people, maybe. Yeah, you know, that's right, yeah. Because a lot of the shopkeepers lived over the premises. But there were not a lot of shops, and most of them kind of similar as well, like. Yeah. Well, there was, it must have been. Uh, well, the most loads of people coming that. in, like. Yeah, yeah they, they didn't survive in the long yeah. term, really. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. When the supermarkets came and sort of blew them away, like, mm. but a lot of them would have had another interest, like, you know, some of them yeah, would have you said farm or something like that, had a bit of land and stuff know, like that, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I often think of how small the town was, and when I think that there was maybe 10 or 11 butchers in it, like, yeah. And when I think of, like, when I think of it, like, that there was 10, 10 maybe milkmen, independent milkmen coming and delivering milk around the houses, oh. like, and that. You know, you don't know how yeah. everybody got something out of it, obviously, but yeah. the bigger shops came in and that, like, and they all died. Pushed out of the way, yeah. You know. yeah. Did you mention before, like, uh, something like uh, the milk would have been delivered twice a day? Maybe? The milk would have been delivered twice a day in most cases, particularly in the summer, yeah. the four summer months, and because the, like people had no fridges, or very few people had fridges. Like. Yeah. So the milk man, most of the milk men would come twice a day. Yeah. They'd come in the morning, like, but no, morning it'd be 10 o'clock or half 10 and the milkman would come. And they'd come back in the evening at half 7 or 8 o'clock again, like, you know. Mm. As we spoke about before, the shops didn't open, maybe, still open there, but it be open 10 o'clock in the morning, like, mm. again, them shops would open, or maybe half 10, the drapers and that, like. Yeah, and most people would be going to school or rough whatever. But yeah. yeah, I remember when we'd be going to school, like, you'd see the shopkeepers, the first thing they'd do the swept outside the shops. Yeah. And some of them, the grocers in particular, or the butchers, they'd be writing on the windows what the specials were. The like. sign, the sign, yeah. the creative kind of people yeah. writing, like, you're running. They were able to do that, the day's special yeah. or this week's special or that. As you said, everybody was respectful and, you know, of their attire, the way they presented. Oh, yeah, the like, shopkeepers yeah. dressed immaculately. Like. Yeah. The, most of them, like, well, the, the ones in the grocery shops that have to have aprons on them or coats, mm. but the, the shopkeepers, like the, the people that had, we'd say, the hardware stores and uh, the, the ones that had the shoe shops and the ones that had the draper shops yeah. and them sort of people, like they all dressed in three piece suits with with pocket watches, like yeah, with white starched shirts. Yeah, and yeah, well, they actually had the shirts. Yeah. Did do the so shirts hard. had the collar on to like the hard yeah. collar, you know? Yeah, they all dressed as what was. The same. Yeah. Like it, it, and going on like a different immunity stuff like the dog track now or you know, things you would have done like in your own time, like you were heavily involved with the track, weren't you? Well yeah, we I was always up around the track, like I mean I was up around the track like at the football first, mm. like and then I got into the career. Well we always I was up around it a couple of times, but we went up to lead the dogs then about nineteen sixty seven or that. And uh, we got jobs as leaders or jockeys, as to work on. And you were you were seeing different things as well going on up there. Ah, yeah. Well, I seen the track, and I was there when the track was done up. Like it was done up in nineteen sixty nine. Like they put in the tote facilities. Yeah. And they put in the bar and that, and the track would have fly and then for five, six, maybe eight years. Like mm. you could have six hundred people on a, you could have six hundred people on a so Friday night on it. If there was an event on, you could have a couple of hundred more, and you'd have maybe four hundred on a Monday. Well, and uh, the track was a big thing. The tour came, and the people came to bet on the tour. And uh, I got him with Paddy Jordan then, like giving mm. Paddy a hand, walking dogs and whatever. And Paddy, of course, gave me a first greyhound or a half year in first greyhound. Like, mm. I think everybody I, knows Paddy. Like, yeah, yeah, I wasn't the only one around. Now, yeah. Stephen Riley, he get Paddy, Stephen Riley, and the lads giving him a hand, and that was how it was done. Or mm. give you a greyhound, or give you a half share, or one. And Paddy Regan would do the same, or Joe or all. And there was a lot of young fellas around now for the involved in the dogs at the time. Mm. Like, and I yeah. stayed at them. Yeah. And before that, you would have seen like what? Like there was rugby, wasn't there? Well, I, 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 well I, firstly, I was at my first game in 1962 in it. Sam, mm. yeah. Tom Kelly brought me here. 
and we would have started going up to the town league then in 1963 or that, the local competitions like there was the town league and the leader cup and you could have, well you could have anything from 8 to 12 teams in fierce, fierce competitive like, you know, well, the, the town is out and they're being competitive no. like, you might start off at you might start off with 12 teams in it, but some of them would drop out, like, because there'd be, mm. there'd be lads taking it serious and there'd be lads in it for the crack, like, you know. Mm. But teams would come from Mullingar and have a come. Teams would come from Mullingar and that Lone and Cav and, like, and that. And there was, there was the Town League and the Paddy Cloudy Cup, or the, the Leader Cup. The Leader Cup was run on a knockout basis, like. Paddy, uh, the, the, the league was run on a league basis, like. Mm. And there was great teams around the town and great rivalry like and like Lamford Town would have a good local team. I remember the first match I was at in Dublin. It was in 1963. And I remember the town got beaten, I think it was in the Metropolitan Cup final. They had an all local team like. Oh, that's good now. Hmm? That's good like. Yeah, well I'll tell you who you no, had. How much did that today now? Like I'll tell you who you had. You had Lal Donlan, goals. Uh, the Red McKeown, Michael McKeown, that's in there, and Michael McKeown, he's dead. Yeah. Well, the pub, if you want it, but he lives on the Dublin Road. He's in his father, or Michael's father, the Red McKeown, he was called. Yeah, John Donnell and the brother of Lads was left, left full. Harry Fibbs, now he'd be, a nev he'd be an uncle of Bobby Fibbs, a traffic warden now and that. Yeah. His uncle, Harry, who would have been the youngest on the team, he was right half, Hooky O'Connor. Now don't forget, like Lad Donnellan is dead, John Donnellan is dead, Harry Phibbs is dead, Hooky O'Connor was centre half, he's dead. There was a fellow by the name of Jerry Eustace. He played a lot of Gaelic too. They came in from the country to live in now, for like they lived in Tefia. He would have been left half, small, heavy fella. You'd have another fellow then by the name of Joe Nelson. He worked in either the ESB or Board of Moan in Lens for a he he would have been outside right, I think. No, Pascal Quinn would be outside right. Pascal he Quinn, he was the school teacher. He taught me him yeah. yeah, yeah. Remember. He was playing. Uh, Joe Nelson. Well. Frankie Flaherty's still alive. Lives up in Clare. Mel Mulligan. Still alive, lives out of Mel's Road, but hasn't come out in years. Willie Jordan, Paddy's brother, that died. Like, mm. well, that was I'm ninety percent sure that was the team. And I remember they were they were beaten two one or something, and there was fierce. Well, I was only nine at this time. There was fierce controversy and fierce trouble. I had. They were absolutely and totally robbed. I believe. Yeah. Like a, a goal or two that well, home farm scored two. I know, and I think the two goals were offside. And there was a couple of goals for lot the town were disallowed and a penalty or two, like. And they should have been legit they were legitimate, been, yeah. like yeah. And Willie Jordan, that's Paddy's brother. At that time the Munster Cup was an unbelievable competition of like you're talking the Munster Cup. And other southern teams would be in it on a knockout basis it was. And every one every team when it came to the final. You could bring in a guest player. They were called guest players at the time. They weren't regular players, but you could you could nominate a fella to say, well, he's going to play for us in the final. Oh. And Willie Jordan played for Cork Celtic, or Cork Caves, with two teams in Cork at the time. Willie Jordan was approached to be a guest player in the final of the Munster Cup. And he played for, I don't know, was it Celtic or, Celtic or Iberian? But I know he scored one of the goals, and that would have been an awful honour at that time to be asked to be a guest yes. there in the Munster Cup final. Like, mm. and you, know. you say like there was a horse, or uh, uh, community games and rugby up in the yeah. Time. Well, when the rugby club was formed again, I think in the early seventies mm. with the Turners and with whoever else, Pierce McInerf, me and John Doris, and I can't remember them all, of course. But I remember the games in it. They played, well, I definitely remember three or four games in it, and they could have played for a season in it every second Sunday. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember the Turners playing, and uh, Raymond Hackett, Davy Hackett, that had a television place at the bridge. He was on it, and 
I can't remember really who else would have been in it like mm. at that time. But I remember, it, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the rugby was played. But for for how long I don't know. But I do yeah. remember the rugby being played. In it, like. Yeah. And I remember, I remember the first community games. Harry Farrell was very much involved. Like Harry Farrell would be Naaman's brother. He lived in the park road beside Fallon Shop. Oh, right. He was very much involved. He was to the forefront of the first community games, and they were held in the dog track. Hmm. And I think the county sports, it used to be a county sports ran. And uh, I remember Michael Wall and Tommy Reel and all them running in it and that and a lot of strangers. And I think that finally the county sports and the sports would have been ran in it as well. And you had the dog races, you had it, then you had the show there, like. Yeah. The show there would have been a massive day and it all together, mm. like, you know. You go on from roughly well, I remember the trains that started to come in at six o'clock in the morning or that, like, and the animals being walked across the bridge. Like, uh, the gates would be open at seven anyway. Mm. And it could be, it could go on to ten o'clock at night. You know, they'd, they'd jump off of the, they jump off of the horses, like. Mm. You know, the, the animals, like, there was horses in it and there was ponies and horses would be showed and sheep and calves and goats. And all the, all the animals would be showed in the morning, like, and they know how they would come by train, like. Yeah. They'd come because from, they'd be coming some distance, like. Well, well someone could be coming, but if you're coming from Dublin, like, yeah. it's the Dublin Stigo line. So they'd be, they'd be coming from Mead or wherever you would come mm. from, and West Mead and wherever, and they'd get on at the, the mm. stations. And the ones that'd be coming up from Sligo would be coming up from Sligo, mm. Car by Carrick and Shannon and Drummond or whatever. And they'd pull in and be walked, the animals would be walked up, like, a lot of them. Now lorries, and, lorries for transporting, lorries for transporting, we'll say cattle and horses and that would be few and far between at that time. So they, they'd come by train a lot of them like. So there would have been some sight like in town like looking at that. Yeah, well, if you weren't looked ahead of the town, you didn't see it if you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I remember we'd be up early on the day like and you'd be watching, getting a chance to get in of course, walking under a horse or something. Yeah. And, uh, like, it'd be unreal amount of people. Like, how people weren't killed that, I don't know, like. Yeah. You know. It was kind of all over the place. It was all know. out. It, well, it was all out on the outskirts. Mm. All the animals were on the outskirts, like. Because the inside the pitch would it's be held for after dinner for the show jumping. Like. Yeah. And all the animals were judged outside. And that would take the morning end of it. Mm. And then the ICA women would ride to be tents put up. Mm. And there'd be all sorts of confectionery and bread and cakes and apple tarts and rubber tarts and cabbage and turnips and parsnips and scallions and potatoes and onions. They brought their wares in and they were judged. Mm. Like to be best the like like best tough. cake and yeah. <laughs> and they're still, they're a strong group. Like. Jam, to be jam and yeah. marmalade and all that. Like yeah. and I remember, like in the evening, then the show jumping would start, and after about we say. Six o'clock at night or that, the people would go off the gate. And the, the people in the town would go up to see the show jumping. Like that show mm. jumping was the highlight of it for most of the people. Like, And uh, they'd be up there and go on to maybe nine o'clock, ten o'clock at night. Like any Mackin would arrive in that. Like there was a little Gormley man from, there was a little Gormley man from over on Dock the Cliff, Jim Gormley. His brother Brian is still alive, I think, the vet. They were very much into it. They were jockeys had and there was a famous horse in the sixties by the name of Don Drum. He was he was he used to bring in the milk into the village of Don Drum in County Tipperary. Like he was for carton milk. And a man a man bought him by the name of Eddie Wade. Or Tommy Wade, sorry. This is folklore like. Uh, Tommy Wade bought him. Tommy Wade was a jockey, a show jumping jockey. And uh, he represented, he, he jumped in Lamford. Now, I won't say Don Drum jumped in Lamford, but I know Tommy Wade as a jockey jumped in Lamford show because I got very friendly with him in years and years after. And, uh, but he rode Don Drum. Don Drum represented Ireland, like, in the show jumping. But he was a meat horse in Don Drum, bringing the meat into the creamery. In well, Dundrum. he seen something in him, was it? Or? I don't know why, but that's how he, that's how Don... He got done drum and he went done drum ended up as he was. Now if he jumped at the show up here I don't know. You know yeah, but I do know that Tommy Wade jumped yeah. at the show. 
because he told me that I wouldn't have met Tommy Wade until I suppose the mid 70s. Yeah. And I got to know him, he was a bookmaker and a dog owner, and that with the Wade suit down around Cash. Mm. Tommy and Eddie and Jimmy, they're all dead now, I knew them very well. And he used to always ask, he came here several times at the dog wrestling, but he used to ask about Longford in the days he jumped on the show on Longford and one thing and another, like. So that, and it was a high jump, like, to mm. keep up in the bump, like, and it was a stone wall and banks, and it was a big event, like. Wow. That sounds like it was properly staged, like. Yeah, yeah. but uh, the, but the, the final show piece was the senior jump off, you know. and it would go on as I said, and then there'd be a dance. I don't know where they dance dancing long for the arms in later years, but previous to that, I think it used to be in St John's Hall the show dance, like. But the show there was an awful day, like in mm. the town. Big event in that year, like. You know, yeah, like, uh, and it was always held on the tourist and the half day. Oh, right. But, and uh, now the half day might be extended a little bit at three o'clock or whatever, but the shopkeepers would come up, like, and well, the people who worked in the shops and that, it was a big spectacle, like. Mm. They could even have a stall, would they? Like, or there would have been stalls. Well, Paddy McKeown, been... there would be a bar at. Yeah. his grandfather, like, or Michael McKeown's father, John McKeown's father, he had the bar at every mm. year. He had the franchise of the bar. Like. Would be, the chair of a mobile bar with, with, with a lot of six inch yeah. blocks and a couple of sleepers, like. Yeah. A bit behind it, like it. Yeah. I couldn't keep out the drink, like you know. That's it. Massive, yeah, it would have been good money. It was a massive social event. Yeah. Like, that was your dog trip for you. And like, uh, like uh, the fair days, and be something similar with the horses or animals coming in and train maybe as well. Yeah. Like, well, the animals would be coming every in week, like the night before. Some of them would come in. Yeah. And the the buyers would come and they'd stay in different guest houses or stay in the hotels and yeah. that, like. And the fair would start. Well, firstly, we'd be too young to go up. I wouldn't have been up around the fair till I was about 12 years of age, which would be 1966. And the fairs, as big as we thought they were at the time, they would have been sort of coming to an end at that time. Mm. Now, they struggled on to the early 70s. Mm. One or two people that, that didn't believe in March, all the farmers always sold at fairs, so they wanted to come in. But every month they were getting smaller, and eventually they mm. fizzled out. But my year, the recollection of the was like, Firstly, we got we had a day off school, yeah. And uh, I remember like and here that I know that the trains would be going all night, like and the the the, the, the jobbers were, or the, the cattle dealers would come the night before, mm. and they'd stay in the hotel or they'd stay or whatever. They were always dressed very flamboyant, like I can remember them, like because I tell you why I can remember them, because if we go back to what we're talking about, a minute, they'd always pay on the steps at the back. At such a time, like I'll explain that to you later on. But anyway, the town would be black. The whole town, like from the railway bridge, like down to the river bridge, would be black. Which different sections of the town had different ages of cattle, if you understand. Oh, me, right? right, yeah, yeah. The yeah. yearlings one side would call them, and the be the heifers would be the other side or whatever. Like so wherever you were looking for, you knew where to you, go. You knew where to go. Yeah. And the horses were down. The horses would be down, we'll say, from around Supermax, like mm. down to we'll say, Har down to about Quinmorts or that. And the horses was very dangerous to be out among the horses, like mm. because the horses would have to be trod. If I was buying a horse, I'd want to see him trod, like, and he'd either have to be trod or rode down, we'll say, maybe to the military barracks and rode back up again in different prospective buyer would be looking at him, like to watch him moving. Mm. That was their game to see. Like, see, was he lame or not? So Jesus Christ, it was very dangerous to be down yeah. around the horses as bad as so imagine the street would be very busy and this fellow run up down the Yeah, well, they'd be busy, but the local people stayed off and it'll yeah, leave them. Like. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the fear, yeah, I can remember them. And I remember we'd be up to town then after dinner and that, and I could see the cattle jobbers or the cattle dealers, like, good food around them. They always dressed distinctly. That did stand out from anybody else, if you know what I mean. We said that's how you're looking at you, see. Yeah, did have big hats and a of hats or white dust coats. But I can remember them paying the people outside of the banks, like the, every every uh, every dealer would sort of have an assistant, well, like yeah. 
And I can remember the money being handed out, like I'd walk up and he was out to put three cattle off me at £20 a piece of and I got my 60 if you know what I mean. And to be fierce going for luck pennies and beating it, slapping hands and hitting one another in the back. And But I can remember them outside on the steps of the bank, paying the farmers. Like He'd say, right, I'm buying them off you so much money, I'd be outside Ulster Bank at 2 o'clock. And he, bought, he told you he'd be there as well and whatever, and you came down, and of course he knew you, and he knew what he was after buying up here, he paid you there, and then he paid you whatever. And they weren't going to go around the fair with all this money in their pockets. Yeah. Oh, it took yeah, a certain time, that. like, yeah. Yeah, so they go down to the bank to it's draw. Safe enough when they've had their cattle bought, they go to the bank to draw out yeah. what they wanted. Yeah. You understand me? If he wanted, mm. if he was after buying X amount of cattle, he drew out X amount of money, he'd make up in his head, yeah. well, he has to get 65 quid and another fella has to get 55 and that. So he drew out 20s, 10s, 5 or some 1 or some mm. whatever, 10 shilling notes to us to work. But I can remember the men being paid outside. Like. Yeah. Just and then, the, the, he'd die out in the most of them. He'd be brought to the station, he'd be transported by train to Dublin, mm. like. We mm -hmm. go to England, a lot of cattle, go yeah. wherever, but the lot would be transported by train. And then in the evening, then when it would die out at four or five o'clock, the shopkeepers would start to sweep the fronts of the shops again. Oh, that evening? Yeah, yeah. that evening. Like, mm -hmm. The council would have been out too. Yeah. Like, and they'd, they'd plug into the hydrants, like with heavy hoses, like, and wash down the whole streets and be washed down yeah. the fronts of the shops and that. So it was done that night, like, so Yeah, that, yeah. 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 I remember there was a man here beside us, he used to clean a couple of shops and we, I used to go up and give him a hand, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then Mar Marts came in, like, yeah. and the fear days would have been, I don't know when they were at the strongest, but what I mean is, I remember them in the 60s, and as the 60s went on and into the 70s they died out, mm -hmm. and there was a couple of, uh, there was a couple of people kept coming with cattle and then they all disappeared. Like, yeah, because I looked at pictures and the further you went back, yeah, the, the more there was. Back them, like, yeah, the, the more bigger event there was. Streets were full, like, yeah. you know, the back in the 90s, turn of the century, yeah. And then, if you go back then, like, right, that, that was the cattle fair and the horse fair. Are you on now, yeah? Yeah. That was the cattle fairs and the horse fairs. And every Tuesday, one Tuesday in every month, you had a pig fair. Mm. And, like, the pig fair would be held, like, from... Where, where Val O'Connor's flower shop is today, down to Boots Chemist on both sides of Valley Mat Street. Like. Mm. And uh, we didn't get to leave our school for the pig fair. But the pig fair, like a lot of people in the town at that mm. time, like. Yeah. Come in, let's draw a town, has it? Alright, go ahead. You're on the video now. Oh, no. I'm <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of people around the town kept pigs. Yeah. And they'd bring them up, well, like they'd fatten them up and that, and they'd mm. bring them up to the fairs, like they kept them in the back garden. A lot of people kept pigs. Kept Not in large, just small. Oh, so maybe two or three pigs. Yeah, yeah. There was a man here who used to keep them, and I used to go round after school to the couple of houses up round the Harbour Own, whatever, so the terrace and kill a sheet and collect the fall for them every second day, like. Mm. You know, the fall was always left over, it was called fall. It was what was left over after the dinner or the tea. Mm. And I'd go around with a bucket and collect it, like. Yeah. He kept four or five pigs, like. You did a lot of that, though, like, talking about, like. You did a lot of odd jobs, were always I busy. Always, I always worked, like. Well, yeah. What I mean is, like, I put it in this way, it's an old saying. I was, always, I was always able to get money, but I was never able to hold it. Yeah. <laughs> I was a sort of a dead yeah. boy before his time, if you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. But no, I always was at something like. Yeah, yeah. You know, I always was at something. And uh, as I said, the fair, the, the pig fair days, and then laws came in, the people around the town wouldn't be allowed to keep pigs, like our chickens and yeah. that. You know, laws would have come in and things moved on. Yeah, for whatever animal, you have to have certain space or certain well, like allows, uh, like allotment for something. Environment or whatever you want, like, I mean, mm. the pigs were kept in sheds, like, that. Mm. But the, the pig fairs died out, too, like, but the pig fair would be on the chills, and it would be some benefit to the town, but not on the near the same yeah. scale as... Well, it was that. Well, it was, and they would have died, you know, too. Pigs used to be sold on the Saturday, too. And uh, Ron Sean McDermott and Pat Farns, but that all died out when the 70s yeah. came and yeah. the late 60s. That was the end of the, the, both the horse fairs, the cattle fair, and the pig fair. Like, they mm. died out when the 70s came, and, like, things changed, so that was the end of them. Like. Mm. And uh, 
Well, the fair green, like, the fair yeah. green, as we know it, where Mollohan's is now, like, I mean, that mm. was a public amenity, like, it was all sorts held in it, like, from, like, the circuses had come, maybe, mm. they could have three, four circuses a year, different faucets and duffies, and they had come, like, and they come maybe twice a year, those various circuses, and I remember then, the, in the early 60s or that, or 63 or 4, I don't know, was it Chipper Fields or Bertram Mills came, and they were, in, they were big English circus, like, and they were doing a tour of Ireland, and they decided that they'd come to Lamford, and they came to the fair green, they were, they were a vast circus, and uh, this, their animals, the animals that they had came by train, mm. and the, in, the, in, the, in the goods train, in the, the goods trains, like, they'd have carriages, like, for holding animals, like, and then the elephants came and whatever else I had with them, horses and tigers and lions, they were here for about a week. Uh, well, I'd say they were here for more for a week, we've been setting up and mm -hmm. taking it down, like, but I'd say they played for four or five nights, like, they'd have a matinee during the, mm -hmm. in the middle of the day and they'd have the show at night, like. Yeah, it sounds like it was a big call to come to now, like, it, it, yeah, well, they were coming to Ireland, like. so they came, but circuses were very common at that time, yeah, like, and yeah. they were very well supported, like. Yeah. And, uh, I remember the, the parade down the town, the parade some of the animals up and down the town, and men, tall men on stilts, Stilts, like, yeah, 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 It was advertising, like, and yeah. what time the shows were that night, like, and, you had, then you had the carnivals would come, mm. like the carnivals, some of them like you'd have marquee dancing like for a fortnight or three weeks and the carnival had a bumpers and cheer planes and swing boats and... I remember swing boats. Yeah. Uh, spin, spin the wheel like... Because yeah, you'd a wall of debt. <laughs> yeah, well you it would spin have, around like... Yeah, yeah but yeah. that would be... The carnivals had come, like it was Cullen's Carnival and Waxy Torrens, like, and there's a Pongo ad too, like, and mm. Delftstall. Like, Delftstall was, it, it was set up in the roundabout, and there was whatever, there was various pots and Delf and toys and things, and you sold cloakroom tickets, a sixpence a ticket, and a wheel was spinned, and if it stopped, like we'd say, at number 25 pink, whoever had 25 pink had their pick of what they wanted off the stall, like, and that, and... It provided great entertainment and vast. To be sports I had too, to be tug of wars I had and mm. various things and I remember then like I remember then in the sixties there was there was a carnival here and they had a Gaelic tournament like okay. in conjunction with it in the fair green. So the fair green sounds like it was fairly Well the fair green was the fair like I mean it was a massive no, fair was, size of a green. Like. It was a fair yeah, size yeah. of a green, like in the middle of the town. Yeah. And it was used for all them events, and it was used for the underage soccer, like. Yeah. The soccer was played, in it. and in the winter time, some of the some of the butchers might put sheep into it to fatten them up, like if they eat the grass in the winter or whatever. When it when the carnival would be yeah. on, and uh, but it was not going on, like it was the grass was long, long or whatever, like yeah, yeah. And it closed then. The underage football would be played, and as I said, the carnivals and. Uh, the football tournaments during the carnivals and the circus as it began it and then it, I think about 19, August 1965 or 66 it closed because I'll never forget it because I remember we played in the last game that was ever played in the fair green. You played now? Oh in the last soccer game yeah like we had a team here Red United Tom Kelly and Christy Shields over us and uh, the Teffy and Celtic were having a fierce team at yeah. the time. Dan yeah. Rooney, Nixon Hughes, Mickey Rogers, Eddie Ragan, some of the uh, the, the walls that we played, Eddie Feely. I can't remember them all, like some of the fires. And uh, I remember we bet them 4 1 or 4 0. Okay. But I do remember, what I remember is I remember my mother telling us that if we won, Sean was in goals, she said if we won, if we won she bring us to Dublin for the day out the next day. The whole team, like? Or no, she just yourself. brought her. Oh. And uh, I remember, well, first I remember the match, I remember the machinery parked over in the corner. And oh. when we were going up to get the train the next morning, they were starting to dig out the foundations. And that would have been 1965 or 66. And what was going in your head at the time, like? What were you thinking, oh, this is sad now? Well, it was sad in a way, but... 
I remember the last game, there was an awful lot of people out because people wanted to be there for the last game. Like, yeah. To say that they were there for the last game of soccer that was ever played or the last time that yeah. the public ever used uh, the fair green. And what was talked about as a new spot? Like, was Abbey Carton going at the time? Was no, no I, I, when the green closed, we started playing Teffia. Okay. In the green in Teffia. Yeah. And the final stain would be played in the dog track. Like to be played as a curtain raiser, we say maybe to yeah. the final of the leader cup, yeah. or to the final of the town league. And should you get played in? Do you get played in the dog track? Like we thought it was like playing in Wembley, like a big stadium. Jesus yeah. was a massive place to be, like you know. One thing, but I remember my grandfather always some same name. I think he used to hold the goalposts or the nets yeah, like, for the no, well, football and fire. Your grandfather Crown was very, very much involved. involved with the, not for yeah, yeah, the Crowns were always involved in yeah. soccer. And uh, he it was, actually he formed a team in Boyle when he was down there. But when he came back to Longford, he was a referee. Yeah. And he was involved with Tom Kelly and forming a team by the name of Longford Celtic. So Longford Celtic, yeah. remember that? Selling tickets yeah. and your grandfather had the nets in the back and of was, the shed, yeah. That was your grandfather's nickname. Yeah. I mean, he came a couple of greyhounds too. Yeah. Like the more than my mother oh, yeah. that day came from down around Water Street. Like, yeah. The Crowns. He'd have a brother, Jowler. The Jowler, her, he was. Mrs. Donnelly was another yeah. one of them. Yeah, they were all there, like, they all yeah. down for people through and through. And you're going to have had a very much involved in the soccer mm. and refereeing and that, like, and it was involved in soccer teams, like, yeah. Mm. All it is, they get played in the dog track was a great thing, like, you yeah. Know. And, uh, played the football for under age. St stopped playing football, I suppose, around 17, and I played a good bit of Gaelic, too. So, sorry for you, I'm sorry for the soccer. Mm. Should have stayed now. But uh, mm. then started at the dogs and dogs took over then and that was it. But that was the fair green at the time and yeah. uh, like and, and then at that time too in Lawford, like see Lawford was a very busy town, like it was there was a lot of factories and fierce yeah. employment like in Lawford at that time. Like mm. now I'm talking about in the sixties. Mm. Some of them mightn't have come until later on, but I mean my first memories of Lawford in the early sixties would be but right. That factory was built up there, there were German people that came to build it. I think it was Ben Setter, or Molly Mex was the original name. And I'd say that there was 150, 130, 150 people employed in the like. Mostly girls now. Mm. A lot of men as maintenance men and for mm. fixing the machines and electricians and that. And big employment there. And you went up over the bridge, 100 yards, I'd get Fondermans. Fondermans mm. was built in 1962. Because I can still see the sign when they were in Paris, found in 1962. There were another German factory that came here. Mm. I did get big employment. Seamus Finn was the manager of it, and Mervyn Ham would have been, like, let's call him the electrician or maintenance man, and Tony Flaherty worked in it, and Jerry Klein, and Patrick Sheaves, and Tom Corcoran, and I can't remember how many more men, but an awful lot of girls worked in it, and mm. actually worked in it. We, when they left school and that, like they went to work in the factories and they went to work in Fondermans. Then you went down Teffy and into Glack, you had Love Groves, like. Mm. Love Groves was, like, I many was in Woodgrove, Love Groves, I'm sure it was 60, 70 people in it, like. And prior to that, or just on before that, the Weavers would have been more or less on its last legs, like. The Weavers, as I were done, stores. And again, like the weavers were big employers too. They, were, they had that many working and actually they used to have their own team in the town league. Like. Right. There was that many fellas working right. in that league. Not to name them all, Harry Fibs and the Flaherty's and Father Doyle used to play with them and lived out beside it. And I can't remember who else, but they, the Condies from Temple Michael down there. And they all worked in the weavers and all them girls from down there, they worked in the weavers. and. There was a factory in Stride, Mick Flanagan had a factory here, it was a sweet factory out at Stride, out her own for Barney Fallon's as now too was. And there was other factories there later on that, like there was always a factory mm -hmm. out in that area and that gave employment. And then in the mid to late seventies, textile came to Longford, like mm -hmm. textiles would have been a vast place, like that's out on the Fennelly Road now, like if you want to call it, you'll see it there and off to your left, opposite the Bishop Palace. It's Fennelly's or something there now. It's Fennelly's yeah. that there. They were there and like you had, like you had the ribbon factory on the battery. 
still there to this day, but the ribbon factory, like a lot of people work in the ribbon factory and Lions of Meat Factory like could have been vast amount. Yeah, it could yeah. have been it could have been a hundred and fifty, two hundred people working in Lions or something. Like. Yeah. I think there was thousands down the years I would come in and out of it like Oh Jesus stop. More and then you had tool and plastic in little water street like mm. That's because these providers, like they were tool and plastic or some of them for Still going today, I think they were just recently bought. Still going today, yeah, I don't know where they company. are now out in the band of the Road. Road. I think, yeah, they were just bought. And then, down here now, where super value is, you had gem plast. Hmm. Like, again, there was 60, 70 people working on that, like. Thomas Sexton worked, uh, May Braid and John Galvin. Billy Ryan was the kind of big name and a manager who was going well in the end. They actually used to have a five-a-side or seven-a-side tournament. Ran, played in the grounds of it, like. You know, there was a field yeah. for, like, <coughs> to run the gym at Plast League or the gym at seven-a-side. And, uh, well, like, later on, then, like, well, of course, you had McNally and Whelan's, like, mm. where I worked, like, there was 35 to 40 people working in that. Like the CIE yard, like it provided an awful lot of employment. Like mm. there was a, like there was there was a lot of lorry drivers. Like they were hauling cattle and everything and furniture. And there was people working in the stores in it. Like and the people on the drays. There would have been a lot of employment up around the railway. Like mm. between the garage, the station, and the yard, I'd say there was a hundred people. Well, and there could be more. Yeah, yeah. Hanlon's as well. Yeah. Well then, when I was going to go back to Hanlon's, like, you had Lennon's then, like, Lennon saw me on, yeah. out of Tride, like. Now it wouldn't be near as big a concern as today, but there was a good few people working in it, like. And you had Lyons' tannery out the road, like, mm. in Plumdra, where the mill is now, like, a lot of people working. It was only five miles out the road, a lot of people worked in Lyons', like. Mm. And later on, then, a bit, like, Handlands came, like Handlands was a vast concern altogether, like. Mm -hmm. Handlands would have opened up, I would think, I wouldn't be sure, but it would have opened up in the late 70s as an ambulance factory or mm -hmm. that, like, and... Like, Burlington came on stream then, like, in the late 70s, out the road as well, and... Fenlands then were here and Harbour all first, but they moved to the industrial estate. They gave a lot of employment, like, mm -hmm. and, uh Meldine then, young Mel as we call him, uh, he he and David McNiven set up a factory that came compulsory that you had to have a cab on a tractor, like in the late 70s mm -hmm. or that. And they started the factory, they started putting the cabs on the tractor. Good idea. <laughs> and then they got a big contract, I think it was putting cabs on putting cabs on ES, crew cabs on ESB lorries and that, like. And they give a lot of employment down there, yeah. opposite Gangley's now. I think oh, the place okay. still stands to this day. Like, they give a lot of employment, but that would have been in the late 70s, early 80s, like. And as I said, the CIE yard, yeah, there was vast employment around mm -hmm. them. Like, you could literally go up. You could leave one place on a Friday and start someplace else on a month, really, like, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of building, like there was a lot of big building contractors around Lamford there at that time. Yeah. Like, I mean, well, some of them still go on to this day. Well, not the original people that formed the companies, like, but their the names their are. offsprings, like their children. Like, I mean, like Paddy McLaughlin, like, I mean, it was unbelievable the work. Like, he built a lot of churches and that. Like, McLaughlin's they're still there and still flying on the Dublin Road, you know. Frank McCairn lived, like McCairns are still going, that's young Frank now today, Father McCairn's father, like McCairn. Uh, the, the Cunninghams were big, were building contractors too, good, done a lot of work around, like they employed a lot of people, they lived on the Dublin Road, they all went away, all died out and went away and that, maybe some of them alive in England, like in, Paddy McKeown, like at the railway, he built a lot of houses and he built all them houses inside Legion Terrace, like. Like initially there was only 12 houses in Legion Terrace. If you went to Legion Terrace and go over to your right, young Mickey Phillips and I had lived there, Paddy McKeown built them and he built the houses on the Park Road. There's six or eight houses there on there the Park Road. Yeah. He built them and I think he built the red brick houses on the Park Road on your left hand side going up to the the bridge, like? No, we're going to afford the down track, like. Oh, yeah. 
No, the red brick houses are just in off there. Yeah. He built them and he built, he built uh, Kennedy Drive there and half. He built, he done a done contract. He was a big building contractor, I reckon. John McHugh was a building contractor and provider of the lab. And then in the 70s, the late 70s, Tommy, Tommy Lyons, Andy's brother, and another man, Sean Kniff, they had Highland construction, like they had done a lot of work and they built the uh, they built the, the Fountain Blue, as I would call it, like out there and that. Mm. Like. So, what I'm saying is, like, there was an awful lot of employment around Longford. Mm. Like. Mm. Longford was a vibrant town with a lot of employment in it. Yeah. And I like the idea of, of the small business persons. You said that the, your father and grandfather would have had a, they had a cobbler that would have had in the house. Yeah, well, that's. Not a business it does, or. People yeah, a lot of them had done that. Like my father here, as I said, like there was shoes fixed here in this house and that, yeah. like, and uh, fixed up till about nineteen sixty-two or whatever time my father went to England, like. Again, small place, but there would have been a, back then. It wasn't even all, but there would have been a lot of families living in one one room, two rooms. Yeah, well, yeah, well, the houses else. were small, like. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's often said. Of course, it's only a myth. It's only said, like, when the people got the houses in Taffy, they said they got lost in the middle of that way. <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the same when they moved in, yeah. Taffy was built in the early 50s. Like, like all of them, most of the rooms have a fireplace, like. yeah. Well, it would have been ten and ten and all, all the old houses, lodgers, lodgers, like, yeah. all the old houses. There's two fireplaces up here where they're covered in, like, but yeah. all the rooms had mm. fire because there was no other heating. So, I mean, if the weather was really bad in the winter, there were like they lit a fire upstairs at night and threw a couple of turf on it, like, yeah. Yeah, the rooms in Taffy have fires as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like Taffy and was fierce, well thought out of. For it, it was built like we'd say in the fifties. Like I mean, which is seventy years ago, nearly sixty-five years mm -hmm. ago. Like I mean, you look at it like this: the all of the majority in Taffy, yeah, but apart, you take the green area, like mm -hmm. which was fierce, forward thinking, like for a play area for the children. But if you study the houses in Taffy, you go up sometime and study them. And a lot of them have what you call service entries. Mm. The, like, as regards, I'd say, service entry is for bringing in fuel or for bringing out bins. And you don't, there's nobody in Teffia really, I don't think, or very few of there is. But of course, there's two back lanes. But even if you look at the houses, if they're not gable end houses, like, mm. there's what you call a service entry. If you go up and look, we say, where your yes, I, know, I know two of them, man. Where yeah, Bob and Claire was. Yeah, yeah. Where Mickey Cron was. You look down that yeah. line, go over there behind that, like, yeah. to the back of that, and there was service entries. So it meant that in very few cases, the coal man happened to come into the, the, house, into the, the house. house with a wet bag of coal on his back or dragging out bins, in the, only in an exceptional case. Like. That was the reason for that, like. That was the reason for them little entries. Yeah, service. I know two or three in that row. Yeah, I think look two at them, anyway. were service entries. Yeah, that, like. three, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but the same people got like, like it was something. Got lost. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it um, was. Uh, but the house, like people lived in small houses, big yeah. families in small houses, not in every house, but there were some families. Like there was two families here. I think there was twelve of one and fourteen in another. Yeah, I don't know how it was done, but that's the way it was. I, it was the same, same every place, the same on the country too. Yeah, people manage. You manage. Like, you don't even people know. People manage. Yeah, oh. but like, yeah, it would have been. Back then, you'd go in one house and it would be a, anything about it, or you borrow this, borrow that. Oh, yeah, well, people lived, like, the doors were always open, like, to one another. And down here, like, I pride myself in saying that I would live in one of the few areas in Longford, not the last one, where, like, everybody literally goes into one another's house, yeah. like. Mm. And if there's, if there's short of anything, so you go to the person next door. Like, if you wanted to have a cup of milk mm. to make a cup of tea before you went in the morning, will you go over and knock to the neighbour and give you whatever, or you give them a couple of tea bags if you want them, or a fire lighter, or whatever. And that's the way, mm. you know what I mean? You, we have great neighbours there. Like, yeah, yeah. And we always had. It would have been different and so over children doing it, fighting and arguing, yeah. but that is nothing. But yeah. I would have to say that we come from one of the last areas, like, where we know our neighbours. Like. Yeah. Mm. And one, in the olden days here, like if anything went wrong, if a woman took sick or if a woman had to go and have a child, well, the woman next door done whatever was to be done around the house or vice versa, like, and that was the way it was. Very still, nearly, very good. still yeah. here, like, I could call on anybody here if I was sick or sore or had to want it, and I'd always, 
Like, I know that they could call on me and I could call on them. Like, mm. Mm. You know, just say you look know, after one another's backs. A lot of the older people that originally lived here, of course, that have to be, because it's up at 110 years old, are dead. But their children or grandchildren are here and still here in a lot of cases. Like, and this is a tradition that carried on, that carries on, like, you know. And all these houses, now, when I look at the 22 of them, I suppose there's 14, 15, 16 of them still go back to the people who's literally here from day one. Well, like, you know. And as in changes, as in, like, when you would have been here when you were young, like, TVs wasn't, wasn't a thing, only come in. No, we wouldn't have having a TV. Like, I'd say we didn't have a television, like, until... I'd say we definitely didn't have one until 1970, I would say. Mm. Now, we might not have it then, but... We wouldn't have one before that, like. Yeah. And there would have been an awful lot of more people. Oh, it was common thing like yeah. that. You're very common. And, and, and you might think this is crazy. Yeah. The older people didn't want to let electrical stuff around the house. Yeah. People were afraid of electric, like. Well, do you know what I mean to an extent, like? Yeah. The old Jesus picks up, plug out that, this has some plug. That could go on fire and burn down, sort of thing. Yeah. Like. Do you know, that's the way people were, like, you know. Mm, it was a strange thing, like it was, do you know, like it was, yeah, odd, like. Yeah, yeah. and I, and I, I remember the deaths, like, in the families, like, when some, when a person would die in a family, like, to the people mourned for a year. A year? Yeah. Like, first they went around, the women in particular went around, particular, all dressed in black, for maybe six months. And the final episode, the wireless wouldn't be turned on maybe for a month or six weeks. And you uh, like I, I thought like a day or two. Oh Jesus, no, it was a massive thing. People were more than like for up on a year or that. And the final thing was, the last little thing was, when you come out of black or whatever, they'd have a little diamond on their coat. And that was the signal that to show that, like, that somebody was after dying maybe six, eight months before them and that like. Oh yeah, there really was. But the person had been like buried, obviously. Like yeah, they were, they were just mourning. They mourning were mourning the person. person. They had be their oh, father, yeah. or their mother, or their brother, or their sister, or husband, or whatever. Like, people mourned like, like for the radio wouldn't be turned on. And another thing was, I remember here like my grandmother died when we were young. The mirror used to be turned inside out. Yeah. They told that to people and thought it was mental. But they got back to me and said like I read about that. Yeah. You no, I wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go to the hauntings or something or like that. They wouldn't go to the bingo, like, yeah. or they wouldn't go here for whatever. Like, yeah. They reckon it's bad luck or something like that. Yeah, whatever. Or something the more to be turned inside out or be covered if it was thunder and lightning. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of it was superstition. Yeah. Of, but yeah, oh Jesus. Well, it's people, true, but people do mourn people. They never, you never, yeah. you know, you never get over the fact that some, you lost somebody. You know? Yeah, but that was the way it was to put around in black, like for maybe six months had torn down and then like they'd have the last thing it'd be this little patch, black patch on their coats. Black and patch, after right, twelve months. After yeah, then after twelve months that came off and that was that mm. was the way it was. Mm. You know. God fear the people I suppose yeah. like that. Another thing I can remember, I don't know what it sees was, but I remember the offerings at the church, like when somebody died. There was offerings. How do you mean, like, you, to the priest of the church? Yeah, to the priest or to the yeah. church, like, yeah. And you sat around in a little bit, in, over on the right-hand side of your way, and the people would come down and put the offerings on the table. You know? For the people that were mourning and were doing this, like? The people that were mourning would be yeah. sitting around, and the people that was at the funeral would come and put the oh, offerings. Oh, I see what you mean. So people come and give help, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, they, no, the, the church got the offerings, oh, okay, like, okay, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that finished, but there used to be offers, like, but, uh, yeah, things have changed a lot, but yeah, as you said, television's like, there's no television yeah. here, like, it's little bit. Yeah. You say, did you tell me that there was a long man score, the first point television? Yeah, but, but yeah, I've seen it in me, me aunt's house, because we had an Italian, and I'm done to me aunt and Dev yet. On a St. Patrick's Day, the Railway Cup used to be on. It was an mm. awful honour to play for your province in a Railway Cup, like. Mm. That was the four provinces, like. There was a team picked from Leinster, Munster, Ulster and Connacht. And uh, Paul Garrity was re re obviously representing Leinster. He was a footballer, he was a listener here in the town and he was uh, county, played for the county. But he scored the first score that was seen on television, on RTE, 
Parnock Garrity scored it in Railway Cup game in Crow Park in whatever year, but I know I was up in my auntie's house and seen it, so I think it was about 1962, but I'm not mm. sure. But I know it's in the history book, but I remember it being there, like all the excitement. I remember the Railway Cup would be a big thing. Right? And do you remember any characters? Remember these people on the street selling the newspaper? And I remember Joe O'Neill, like. Joe O'Neill used to sell newspapers. Gay guy, his brother used to sell them, like. Yeah. Selling newspapers was common, like, yeah. you know. There's all sorts of characters around the town. Yeah. Like, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of cattle drovers around the town, like, and they lived rough enough, like, they, they were men that walked cattle to fears, like. Mm. You know, you might, there was men like that that walked cattle maybe yet and ten miles to a fear, like. There's some road. walking now. Yeah, well, that's what they don't do. But there wasn't but, much traffic on the roads, maybe, back then. There was none. Yeah. No, this is before my time, or something. Oh, like. yeah. But they were called cattle drovers, like, and they, that was their profession and their job, like. Mm. But walk cattle from fear to fear, like. Well. You know. I guess it's changed time, but everything doesn't last. Yeah, no, exactly. Forever, right? It's a different era, like, yeah. yeah. Look, thanks very much for talking about you and telling me all that. You're very happy now, yeah. yeah I appreciate that very much. I hope I didn't bore you. No, it's at all.